So good morning. Let's see, did you have fun on Friday? Did you learn anything? Yeah. So in general, as you realize, when it comes to defense, you don't have a whole lot of time. So that, in particular, the opponent jumps pretty quickly into the deep side of the pool. Uh, so most of the questions there were, of course, way more advanced than you would expect on the undergraduate level. But the key message that you might want to see there is that there's a surprising amount of, there's a surprising amount of cutting edge research that really goes back to very simple things, Boltzmann distribution, delta Gs, understanding how you can derive delta Gs. And uh, I think there were at least three or four of the questions that Christian got from Tom that were really about how can you measure this and can you back the equations and prove why it's right. So the whole point is that just because you're graduating and start doing PhD research, that doesn't mean, really mean you do more advanced stuff in the sense that you're applying it to more advanced stuff, but the equations are pretty much the same. Uh, you don't necessarily use more advanced equations, it's just that you have to think more about them. I would suggest that we start by discussing some of the things we covered on Friday. I'm going to come back to some of these things today too, because I'm well aware that today things are starting to get a bit more complicated. Uh, we will pretty much finish the discussion about protein kinetics today. <laughs> And then tomorrow, likely, I will be speaking a bit about free energist um, design of proteins, possibly a little bit about drug design. And then on Friday, likely, I'm going to finish up with talking about uh, docking, high throughput studies and everything, basically everything you can do in industry. Um, you're going to have two, I think we're only going to do two more labs actually this week because Dara and Bjorn have been happy with you. And depending on... I might actually try to move the uh, docking part until tomorrow so that you have a chance to go through that before the lab on Thursday because I think their plan was to give you Friday afternoon off. And then early next week we'll finish up everything. I might talk a little bit about our research and I'm going to do a repetition of the entire course and then next Friday we have the exam. Things are going fast. Discussions. Pick a question and get started. Do you have handouts? Oh yes, we do. We do have handouts. There you go. <laughs> Panhandling. <laughs> but those aren't going to help you a whole lot with this slide. <laughs> Actually, the danger with choosing what you can answer is that you tend to answer the things you already know rather than the things you don't know, which is a really stupid strategy. So I'll suggest doing sli something slightly different. Let's get started and take question number one, <laughs> and then we'll just go around the table. So the native state is the folded stable state of the protein. The molten globule is when it denatures, but it's not necessarily completely unfolded. It's just kind of looser and not as compact. And the random coil would be something completely Right, and when we frequently talk about denaturation or something, which one is the most common of the non-folded states? Yes, so the whole, the whole thing is that it's, it's a bit bad that we keep talking about folded versus unfolded states, where it turns out that this is really completely unfolded when every single trace of protein structure is destroyed, it doesn't really occur in nature. You can create it in the lab with high temperature and very high concentrations of denaturant. But in your body, you will get a molten globular the second something exits the ribosome. And uh, then it's a question. Real protein folding is mostly a question about how it transfer between the molten globular and the native state or back. Uh, does it help us to understand the protein like folding? Yes. Uh, and we're going to come back a whole lot more to that today. Because the, the big question that we really haven't solved, I'm not sure if you remember it, is that we don't, we can't, Going back all the way to Leventhal, right? We cannot understand why, can pro why do proteins fold so fast? And what is that really that determines when a protein can fold and how it can fold? We haven't solved that. We're going to try to solve that after the break today. Um, but the key thing is that it's really this transition between molten globulin and native that determines every single properties of the proteins we see. What is the characteristics of the barrier? What is that stabilized protein structure and everything? And the reason why that is important, that's because that's a second problem, by the time you start trying to design a protein or something, it's not just enough that the protein you've designed has a neat binding site for molecule X, if you want to catalyze some process involving molecule X, you're also going to need this protein to fold reasonably fast, or otherwise you're just going to have a sequence. It's not going to be a protein. And that turns out to be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> 
But we'll cover that uh, in a lot of detail today. Arenas, in an NMR experiment, which one of these would be the multiglobula be most similar to? Are you asking me? Yes. Okay. Because I'm a bit nasty. I'll just go around the table. I'm not so interested in the answer. I'm more interested in how you think about it. Okay, so NMR is not like crystal, so it will be not the rich uh, structure thing. Yes, uh, so, and the whole idea with, sorry, the, the whole idea with the NMR experiment is, of course, that you can get approximate results under realistic conditions, that is under room temperature or something. Um, in an X-ray crystal, you would uh, need to have it at 100 Kelvin, which is... So the key thing is necessarily an NMR or experiment, but it's under realistic conditions. So in room temperature, be... So what does the molten globula look like? No, so that you know, you don't necessarily have high temperature. You can, as you, if you're really bringing the temperature up, sorry, if you, if you increase the temperature a bit, you might go from native to molten globula. Uh, if you go to really high temperatures and high concentrations of denaturant, you would eventually read the random coil. But my, my point with this question is really that in practice, it's virtually indistinguishable at room temperature if you have a look at molten globula versus native when you look at all these average properties. Like the concentration of secondary structure, the, uh, this is not an NMR course, I don't expect you to know NMR, but you have all the, NMR helps you to derive contacts between residues. You can see, for instance, that residue 47 must be close to residue 396, etc. But all these pr average properties, there's hardly going to be any difference in NMR. It's going to look not just similar to, but virtually identical to the native state. It's very hard to detect that type, the first type of unfolding in NMR. In an X-ray structure, you would see it because, again, the molten globula would not, well, first, the molten globula wouldn't really crystallize because if it crystallizes, it would likely have to fold, right? But the point is that at first sight, you, if I just showed you two pictures, I should have that in the slide. I'll do that next year. If I just showed you two pictures, I bet you couldn't separate molten globula from native in most cases. The devil is in the detail, very small details of side chain packing and everything that determines when you really click in and fold the fold, form the folded state. So, because in a molten global, hmm? we have the hydrophobic effect that doesn't allow it to unfold. And it's because through these technique experiments, we can see this. Well, no, so they are the, the key thing with the hydrophobic effect, right, is that when you start with a completely random coil, the random coil collapsing to a molten globular is going to happen instantly. At any, any sane temperature that you would ever look at in NMR, you're going to have the chain collapse to this intermediate state. Uh, sorry, the other part you asked about was... So that's the, the main part. The hydrophobic effect is what explains the transition from random coil to molten globular. So when you are in the molten globular, you pretty much you no longer expose any hydrophobic amino acids. You even have most of the secondary structure formed. And the only thing that really hasn't formed is the detailed sites in packing, and you need to push out the last water of the structure. Now, mind you, this far, that's something you're going to have to take my word for, but I will show some computer simulations that that does indeed seem to be the case that pushing out the water is the last step. No, not really. So first thing, the caveat here is that 
Cryem, all the all these in Cryem you need to freeze something, right? Uh, you typically plant freeze it, which means that you get you don't really get normal ice. You get a vitrified system around it. Um, if you actually go all the way and determine a structure, yes, of course, you're going to see these tiny details, right? That uh, there is differences in the uh, amount of water contents. But look at these biophysical properties about the first approximation of what is in contact with what and how much secondary structure do you have. There are virtually no differences there. So if we continue with three, why is it important that proteins are polymers? The number of microstates where would be so large? Well, having a large number of microstates is good, right? So the key thing, uh, so the the key thing with folding is that it's not one state, right? You're always looking at at least two states. So of course, if something is good in one state. Transition-wise, it's going to be bad for the other state. So if the number of microstates is short, um, polymers has to do with the fact that the number of microstates are, can become very large. But in what states would they become very large? Yes. Because that, the second you fold it, right, by definition, well, if you have something folded, you have already started to have the residue since the proximity of each other. So there's not going to be an infinite number of states there. But in the unfolded state, if they're not connected, they would on average be infinitely far away from each other. Um, so that's, and this actually is not, this is very common. Um, so the second you start to design proteins or design an allosteric modulator, design something that should change an interaction, there are two things you can do. If you have a closed state and an open state, for instance, in a protein channel, and you would like the channel to be more open, there are two strategies. You can either stabilize the open state or destabilize the closed state. And in many cases, it's kind of 50-50. There are different drugs do different things. Both of them can work really well. So related to that, why is it important that proteins are heteropolymers then? So there is a key word that I like you to use there to think in terms of that helps you a lot. Specificity, right? Uh, because we're talking that you need all these sec um, side chain interactions and packing, the, it has to click. It has to be fit like pieces in a puzzle. And if you do not have that specificity, you're just going to have a hydrophobic collapsed blob or AKA molten globule. So the reason why you get native states is that when you have all the pieces in the puzzle fit perfectly. And that will, of course, depend on how the pieces fit together, right? If the pieces do not fit together specifically, you're not going to have one specific state that's better than the others. All right, Sarah, uh, side chain. How are side chains packed in a native state? Jesus, that's an answer. I keep, I keep uh, well, answer it the other way. Well, then reason about it. What can you say? You can say so, so that first, that's a very bad answer. You should never ever say that you don't know something. Um, because you do know, I would bet you know something about it. And in general, when it comes to solving difficult problems, and now I'm not talking about classes, now I'm talking about life in general or in particular research in general, saying that you don't know something about something, that's giving up. And no hard problem, in particular, we're going to go through some equations later today. No hard problem was ever solved instantaneously. So when you start working on a hard problem, you start to focus on what do I know about the problem. So focus on what you do know about it rather than what you don't know about it and see how far we can go. So what do you know about side chain packing in native states? So you look at lysine and leucine in a globular protein. Which one is going to be on the inside? Um, okay, so you do know something about it. Yeah. yeah. So don't say you don't know anything about it. Let's start about. <laughs> um, 
And why is that the case? Just given the state of the sea, small and hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. Yeah. So first, we, we have hydrophobic things on the inside. Um, the second, when we say packing, uh, even if you're based on what we just said about the molten globule in the native states, can you say anything about the density or interactions? Uh, and also what we said about just said about heteropolymers? I guess maybe it will just sort of depends on what the side chain is, right? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the key word I, meant, I talked about, which is? Well, or specificity in terms of size of that. They're specific interactions. It's not just a random blob. And when these are specific, can you even guess something about the density? If you compare the molten globular to the native state, perhaps, particular? Yeah, I mean, I guess comparing those two, it would be more likely that the molten globule is much more dense in a native state just because there's more, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, tight. Going on. So if you were to guess how high the density is compared to say well water or something or the packing efficiency if 100% would be perfect packing what the actual density is in a native state yeah uh, a lot higher than water <laughs> no i wouldn't say that it's higher than water because water is uh, well the density of water is roughly 1 right on average proteins are slightly lighter but if you think in terms of percent it's not going to be better than 100% no. Or 80, but but the point is the pa this packing is high. If you compare it to this, the molten globular, then you start having water or something in it. And I would that is actually the one difference you might be able to see in an MR experiment. Once you get down to the molten globular, there is some water and everything inside. So you probably drop to 60 percent. The whole protein swells a bit like a sponge or something. Uh, and the thing that happens when you actually go to the fully native state, you squeeze out that water and things are really clicked in place. So think of this like I think it's. Think of this as a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, but it's like it's densely packed. It's very specific. You have hydrophobic, hydrophobic, or hydrophilic, hydrophilic. If you ever have a charged side chain inside a protein, you're gonna have you virtually always gonna have a charge of the opposite sign to form one of these so-called salt bridges, plus or minus. Sorry. Yep. Yes. Yes, no, but, but again, if you compare to water, right? Water is, water really is a liquid. It's easy to move things around. It's apparent because it's so small molecules. By definition, proteins first. Proteins are much larger. There are much longer range connections and everything. So the easiest thing to think, if you have two amino acids packed like that, they will not be able to go straight through each other to that state, which is the big problem with bioinformatics and structure prediction. If you make some mistakes with side chains, you're pretty much going to need to unfold the entire protein to get it to fold again. But it's, it's more, if you have to choose, it's more similar to a solid than a liquid. Which comes back, and that's actually an important concept because it relates to what we're going to talk about today, phase transitions, right? A protein folding really is like a phase transition. You're going from something, you can think of the molten globule more as a liquid, but the fully native state more like a solid. Something really happens there. There is a barrier we're going over and forming something different. So let's continue. Eloy, how does the enthalpy vary from unfolded through transition states to native states? I would say the enthalpy doesn't quite change that much. So if we consider the unfolded state, the molten globule, most of the contacts are already established, and it is about refining I think yes, the, so the enthalpy will go down, so it's favorable mm -hmm. for the folding, but not much. It will actually go down, and in particular in the last state, it will go down quite a lot. Um, and then you could argue, well, if, but if this was the only effect in the protein, then you would very rapidly slide downhill, and you would fold an entire protein in like way less than a microsecond. You could fold large proteins in your simulations. Um, the reason why that doesn't suffice to explain it is the next question, which is how the entropy varies from unfolded through transition state to the native state. Will you have a go? Uh, it will be like two waves, and uh, when it's at the transition state, it will be go higher. Mm, so now you probably think about the free energy. If we just look at the entropy part, 
don't think, don't think too much. Just you have this large chain and it's collapsing. What does that do to the entropy? Is it more or less ordered? Uh, after the bodies, it will be more ordered. Right. So that the entropy goes down. And you know what? We're going to come back to this several times today. This is the key. Because what is the free energy? Negative. No, but, uh, the definition wise, what is free energy? Enthalpy minus entropy. Enthalpy minus entropy, <coughs> right. And we just realized that both of these go down. So that whether we have barriers or whether we are stable, that will then depend on the balance between them, right? So it's going to be a very delicate balance in many cases. And that's going to turn out to crack all these problems in the end that we keep explaining why some proteins fold and why others don't. Um, we're going to come back to 8 and 9 too, but we can cover them anyway because this is repetition and it's good that you're... So what is, based on our hand waving of, on Thursday, what is the main free energy barrier when you fold proteins? I didn't prove it, I just hand waved them. Generally, when I hand used to the free energy barrier um, slows down the folding and unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, when the entropy and entropy. Uh, but did you have to choose one of these components, enthalpy or entropy, when you fold the protein, um, which, is the, which is the main barrier for you? Have a second guess. <laughs> Entropy. Um, and the hand waving argument was basically based on the fact that this is a process where you need to search a lot, right? You need to find exactly what site and confirmation should we fit in. The second you have the site and confirmation, the very end game is going to be relatively quick because then you just then you can slide down in the free energy landscape and just improve the energy. But the whole point is that we need to search before we really started getting the benefit of better interactions. So when you fold the protein, the main problem is really that we need to search IA, i.e. entropy. So then during unfolding, this is not fair because this is easier for you then. Uh, the reason for having both these questions, of course, during unfolding, the barrier would rather be enthalpy. And can you reason about that? Why is that reasonable? Right, and, that's, and it's exactly the same process, of course, but now you're, once we have all these beautiful interactions, the first step backwards we're taking, we have to break the beautiful interactions, that costs us lots of energy, right? But we're not really going to gain any entropy, because the last part, we, we don't really have a whole lot for no. But eventually, when we get over the barrier, then we're going to get all the entropy of the state. So when you're folding, we have to search, that's entropy limited. When we unfold, we have to break interactions, and then the energy or enthalpy is primarily the barrier. Um, I'll come, you know what, let's skip 10 for now, because I'm going to talk a whole lot more about that today, and it's uh, the part I talked about last week was a bit too much hand-waving. Um, so let's move to 12. Roughly, what is the probability of random chains to fold? Dorinas. No, 12. So we're skipping the energy gaps. Right. Do you remember roughly what probabilities we spoke about? So that the, the key thing for a random chain to fold is not just a matter of the chain being stable, but it also has to fold. The transition state barriers cannot be impossibly high because then you will never fold in practice. And what I argued about there was that the stabilization energies we saw, they of course they have to be related to KT, and then you compare that to the distribution of these energy defects we had. And that turns out that you got something that was a work of 10 to the minus 8 or so. Whether it's 10 to the minus 7 or 9, I don't really care. But the whole point, it's not 10 to the minus 1 or 2. It's 10 to the minus large number, which means that it's the first approximation is 0. 
And that leads to two things. Uh, it leads to most random sequences that you just synthesize in the lab. They're going to be great at doing what? Where will they end up? If you look at question number one, random, molten globular, and native states. If you just synthesize random sequences, where will they end up? Why would they be random coiled? Right, so that a random sequence on average which should contain roughly 50% hydrophobic and roughly 50% hydrophilic residues. Now, of course, in theory, it's a possibility only having hydrophilic residues in a very long chain, but, and then it might be stretched out. But if you have roughly 50% hydrophobic residues, they're going to want to collapse because of the hydrophobic effect. That really does not have anything to do with protein folding. And this is a scary part because, because I know we spent all this time early on in the course studying the hydrophobic effect. It makes so much sense that you're turning the hydrophobic side chains to the inside. But that doesn't give you a protein. That just gives you a blob with hydrophobic things on the inside, which is very similar to a molten globular because you might form small stretches of helix or so. So a random chain would fold the molten globular, but they would not be able to go through this phase transition to a really stable locked-in native state because then you need specific chains. So that's one part. Uh, and this is a problem because the second you start to synthesize proteins, uh, sorry, not synthesize, but design proteins, well, based on this probability, would you, if you had to design a new protein sequence to do catalyzer reaction or something, what would you do? Right. And why is that? So that probabilities are dangerous. Um, it's very hard to wrap your hand around in particular very large and very small numbers. If something is 10 to the minus 8, forget about it. It's zero. The probability that you are so smart that you will be able to design a protein fold that's stable is virtually zero. Now, there are some computer programs that can occasionally do it. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. But the whole point is by far the easiest approach, pit, pick something that's existing and just try to modify it a little bit. If it's a gigantic protein and you just change a handful of residues around an inter uh, around a binding site, if you're lucky, this might still have the same overall fold and then you just change the binding site. Will that always work? No, because you might be unlucky, right? Uh, it might be that one of the two or three residues you're changing could be a very important residue for the protein stability, and then you just destroyed your protein. You're going to see that in the lab very quickly. So what would you do then? Yes, or, well, actually, that's not such a bad idea. Uh, try a different fold, because there's... If your job is to catalyze reaction X, remember that your job is to catalyze reaction X, not necessarily fold something into fold Y, right? But the other thing that you can do, that computer programs are reasonably good at today, pick the fold, pick the entire fold, and then tell the computer to design a sequence that both binds something here, but also that is stable in this entire fold. This is not a trivial problem, but it's an easier problem for the computer than trying to design something from scratch. So here we know what we're going to fold in and just design Try to design specific interactions that are stable in this fold as a native state. And that's typically what you do in protein design today. And even if, even if you were, you managed to find it like an easy and quick way to make up a structure that's stable, it might not be too stable to function. Sure, and a right, and a particular if you're going to need to bind something large when you need your protein to move, a b well, move or breathe a bit to bind or unbind something. Um, but I'll come back to that later this week when we talk more about design and uh, well, the drug design in general. Uh, 13, what molecules are involved during real protein synthesis in vivo? The ribosome. So what does the ribosome do? No. It's not 
So we skip the ribosome for a second. What is the first step? We need to get from DNA to something. We need to um, copy it. Yes. Uh, and that's done with a protein called? DNA polymerase. There is a reason why I keep bringing those molecules up. That is an insanely complicated process, right? You need to bind to DNA. You need to, s well, first you need to bind a protein to DNA. You need help of other proteins to recognize the site you're going to bind to. You're going to need to cleave the DNA. Uh, like the, num the number of processes this goes through is insane. Uh, the second process is not DNA, but RNA. So there you have RNA polymerase involved too. What does RNA polymerase do? So this is the protein that copies the genetic information to RNA, right, from DNA, so that you can take it to the molecule you mentioned first, which is ribosome. Uh, the ribosome actually always connects to membranes, and that's because there are several membranes in your body. Uh, so this, the protein machinery part of your body is what? Yes, and the endoplasmic reticulum, right. Um, so what happens is that you have these translocons sitting in this membrane. So this is the membrane inside the cell. So the ribosome connects to the translocons and either pushes this out to become globular proteins in the cell or you can push it into the ER membrane. And then if it's a, now going to be a membrane protein that should move all the way to the plasma membrane, your outer membrane, then that's a really complicated process how the protein has to move in that membrane. We actually do not know exactly how that happens. Um, there are all these guesses that it might depend on the concentration of cholesterol or the thickness of your membrane, but we don't really know how membrane proteins diffuse inside the cell. There we, we do know that there are some membrane proteins that are only expressed in the plasma membrane, and there are, so there are differences between them. But exactly how? That's a good PhD product. Well, no, there's probably 100 good PhD products. Uh, a chaperone, then, what does that do? Yes. And in particular, so what type of proteins usually bind, or intermediate states usually bind to the chaperones? Are they like deep pushes? No, the chaperone appears to usually take care of misfolded states or unstable states, things that things that are not according to the main folding pathways. It basically rounds these up and pushes them in the right direction instead. That is also something we're going to come back to today. Uh, there is a reason why that speeds up folding. And then we had three small folding models that I will come back to today. Uh, but let's describe them. Diffusion collision first. Um, this was the one that isn't super common, but maybe like some smaller proteins do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's something about like this, the secondary structure is there, right? And it's sort of just, You're on the right way. You have secondary structure, and it's even a plural, secondary structures, as you said. So what is the th key thing? It almost, you can almost uh, guess it from the name, diffusion and collision. Yeah, I guess just through like, some chemical properties, they sort of just like, block. So the whole, the whole point, of course, they are connected by a chain, right? But you do form the secondary structure elements. They form independently. That's the key word. And then when they have formed independently, they diffuse around. Of course, they're still connected by a chain, so they can't move infinitely apart. And then occasionally, well, okay, they collide, and when they collide in an advantageous position, then they will form larger stable elements. Uh, we're going to see some simulations of that today. We have this intermediate folding model that says hydrophobic collapse. I would argue this is by far the worst, but you should know about it anyway. 
So the problem with the hydrophobic collapse is that in many ways the hydrophobic collapse describes the transition from a random coil to molten globular better. Uh, for that transition I would argue that it's pretty good. But after that it's pretty much magic happens, then everything starts to fold. Uh, and as we've seen from the molten globular and NMR and others experiments, this is not just completely random and hydrophobic. There is a surprising amount of secondary structure and some correct context and everything. So it's, it was a good idea at the time, but it's not really true anymore. And the last part, sorry, the last of the three models is called nucleation condensation, which is also something you can occasionally see in physics. But in terms of proteins, what does that mean? Right, so think of this like a crystal or ice or something for me, that you need to have some sort of first ice crystal start growing, uh, what do you call that, crystallization grain or something. Once that has started to form, you're going to get more things condensing on the surface and you start to grow something. And that it's going to turn out that you won't, we will never ever see that state because that is a very expensive transition state, but that's going to correspond really well to all the things we're seeing. So that nucleation condensation, while a bit complicated, is going to be the main explanation to everything. Uh, and that relates to 18, which is the last thing. We discussed, or I brought up this, I realized it's a hand waving and abstract slide about Amphison and Leventhal and thermodynamic versus kinetic stability. Right, and I think, and this is important because I feel so sorry for Leventhal in the literature that um, everybody gets the credit and everybody just says that Leventhal merely pointed out there's a problem. He didn't merely point out that there's a problem, right? He also suggested that by definition, there is no way while Christian Amphison might be right in the sense that it's just a global minimum, but the point is that in practice for proteins in general, there is no way you can sample every single possible state. Period. And you know what? The second you realize that, pretty much, that, that, that's also a lot of the problem too, because if you cannot sample it by definition, you cannot sample it. The only way you can fold the protein is then if it's somehow it's a guided process. The, the proteins that do fold must fold reasonably fast in some sort of kinetic stability, that it happens because it can happen fast enough. Now, for whatever reason that we haven't explained yet, that what we will look in today, it might actually be the case that these fast folders also by definition tend to lead to the global thermodynamic minimum. But where the proteins can fold biologically, that has to be a matter of kinetic stability. It's completely uninteresting whether they can fold in a billion years. So we're going to talk about that today um, a lot. And we're going to speak a bit about folding rates, Arrhenius plots. It's important at Stockholm University, I guess. Uh, we're going to look at both these transition and intermediate states and come back to what they were. Folding funnels is a very key concept. This really goes back to what I just told you about. A folding funnel is some sort of guided pathway where we are able to fold fast enough. And we're going to use this nucleation condensation model to really explain Leventhal's paradox and what proteins fold fast enough. And this actually works out experimentally too. It's really cool. And then I'm going to talk about the energy gaps and a little bit about this temperature dependencies. So let's, rather than having a boring slide here, I'm going to move to that one and have you explain this. What is what here? A, B, C, D, E, and E. Well, we can have something before A and something after E2. If this is some sort of free energy and we are as a function of a process, what are these different states? E is the global minimum. E is a global minimum, which in terms of proteins you would call native, native state. Good. So here too, the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be for you to answer. <laughs> the yellow was smart. You picked by far the easiest one. C could be a molten globular, or, and, and another way to call that in terms of what I had in the previous slide when we talked about intermediates and transition states. So that's an intermediate state. Why is it an intermediate state? Because it's not the global minimum. It's not a global minimum, but it's a clear state in the sense that since it's locally stable, it's something that is possible to ex observe experimentally. Uh, 
on some, depending on what these barriers are, and hey, this might only be stable for a millisecond, but it is stable for a millisecond. So with some experiments, we should be able to monitor this. It might be hard, but it's possible, theoretically. It could be, of course, in terms of a prion or something, but, but for now we're going to skip that. Um, and, but, but, but this, actually, that's a very good comment. With everything is in the eye of the boulder, right? So what we call a native state is what we might mean a, some sort of biologically active state. And for a prion, you could, of course, say, well, that's the native state and that's the disease state. But to nature, there is no, this just has a matter of, that has to do with the time scales it takes to go over D. But in terms of simple protein folding, this is an intermediate and that's the native state. So what's A then? Another intermediate. Well, or if there is no other really stable state up here, this would be some sort of denatured, denatured state. And whether that's random coilers, I don't really care about now, but that would be a denatured state. So what's B and D? Do these transition barriers? Yes. So B, B and D are transition barriers, uh, or rather, if the barrier is this entire part, what would be that specific state up there be? That's the definition, but there is another word for it. Uh, so Doreen, you almost had it. If the entire part is the barrier, what do you call that specific, the transition state? So that the entire part is usually the transition barrier, and the, with the transition barrier could also be that we interpret that how many kilocalories per mole is it. The specific confirmation there, the specific state is usually called transition state, which is a key concept both in chemistry and everything. So we have two transition states here, B and D. And I drew B fairly low here. And so this would be the co collapse going, if A is denatured and C is molten globular, why is B low? If A is the, some sort of denatured state and C is an intermediate molten globular or something, is it reasonable that this barrier is fairly low in B? Why? Yes, but you can also relate this to what we know experimentally about how fast things happen. <laughs> so we know experimentally that the collapse from some sort of completely unfolded to molten globular this is primarily the hydrophobic collapse, right? This should happen very fast. Not necessarily instantly, but well, I would even say that this, it should happen almost instantly. So you have a very low transition state in B, possibly so low that it's in the ballpark of KT, that it happens almost directly. So you can see that the A and C are in equilibrium and it's easier to Well, so all these states would be at equilibrium after a long time, right? But equilibrium might mean that you have 99.9999999% of the things here. Equilibrium just means that things aren't changing anymore. Um, equilibrium is boring. No, that sounds horrible, but equilibrium has to do with thermodynamics. Now we're talking about kinetics. And kinetics has to do with how far, even when you are in equilibrium, you're still going to have things going from A to C and C to A. It's just that the relative concentrations don't change. And this is the problematic part here, because at equilibrium, you only care about A, C, and E. But now we're talking kinetics, and that's hard. With kinetics, we have to care about D too. So what is D? That would be the side chain packing. Yes, or at least, so this is the transition state between the molten globula and the native state. And what does that do in particular in this process? I would argue that's the most, possibly the more important state in the entire picture. Can the state D here, actually I'll ask you, you just said that B was something. D is also very similar to B, so what type of state is this? That's the transition state, and if we don't have it so high, the protein will unfold very quickly, and then we don't have that well, yeah, well, yes and no. So this is a transition state, it's quite correct that it's a transition state. It's a transition state between what? Well, this is not the unfolded state. What, what state do we call this round? Well, it is, it's not intermediate. intermediate or the molten globular, right? So this is really the transition state during the main part of the folding. Is this going to be a slow or fast process? Slower. Much slower. And we talked about this very briefly a couple of lectures ago. 
when you have one bar barrier that's significantly higher than the others, you typically call that process something or that barrier, that it determines something. Rate limiting or rate determining step, because the rate, this one is very quick. So the height of this barrier is going to determine how quickly you fold. And then the Renus is quite right that if this was much lower, we would unfold quicker, but we would also do something else quicker. We would also fold quicker, right? Uh, so that this all do, th that in turn is going to depend on the balance between C and E. We don't. I didn't put labels here, but what would this be? Why is the free energy very high to the left here before A? Yes, and why does the free energy eventually come very high there? No, well, you would have bonds because we're not, we're not. Uh, it's not a nuclear. Problem. Uh, so the reason, how many eventually, remember this is this is the normal kind of random coil state, but eventually you would get a very high free energy, because that's eventually you would stretch out the chain completely, right? And then you're back to only having one state. So if you start to go very far, you're going to go up in free energy. So this is some balance where we have lots of disorder and everything. You have so many states that it's relatively low. Why does the free energy go up after the folded state? Because the entropy decreases somewhat. Well, and at some point we would start pushing atoms into each other, right? So if, you, if this is some sort of function of density or something, at some point we're going to start having bad energetic interactions and probably even fewer states. Think, I know that this is not entirely easy, but try to think of it in terms of this, because if you understand what these different states are and they do, that's going to serve you way better than just being able to read long lists of what they do. Um, uh, yep. Now a question on the previous slide. So between A, being A the random coil and C the multiple of them, what would the transition state look like? I, so I couldn't predict from the beginning that there is actually a transition. No, but as I said, at this state is going to be in the bulk graph of KT. And if a state is in, if, sorry, if the barrier is in ballpark of KT, effectively you're not going to see it, right? This is going to happen so extremely fast. So first, nothing in nature, even, even here you will always have one side chain that might need to cross another side chain or something. Nothing in nature is ever perfect. Uh, but again, think KT, that it will be, happen so fast that the second that this comes out of the ribosome, a couple of, well, a nano or microsecond later, you're collapsed. So for all intents and purposes, you're right. You're never, gonna, you're never really going to feel this as a barrier at room temperature. So that brings us back to something else. I'm not sure I studied this. Um, if you are in physics, well, let's see, do I have a pen here? Let's forget about A and B for a second. Let's live in a simple world where you have one state here, and you have one state here, and then you have a barrier between them. And then you can start, you know, as a function of time, if you start having, having all your molecules in C, how long does it take until you start having molecules in E? And how quick does that concentration grow? So this is, this is something very similar. This turns out that this is called an exponential process or something. And if you forget completely about kinetics and everything, Initially, if you have everything here, there are going to be lots of molecules that can move over. So that the derivative of the process is kind of going to be proportional to how many molecules you have left. But as molecules move over a barrier or something, you're going to have fewer and fewer and fewer molecules here. And since the derivative was proportional to how many molecules you had, that's going to mean that the speed drops. And if you remember your mathematics, what is the function that it's its own derivative? The exponential. Uh, so if, you, if we for a second imagine that we had, proteins were so simple and remarkably beautiful that folding was a simple process, you had some sort of state here, gigantic barrier, and then a much, so this would be much lower, think of this like 100 kT, and then a beautiful folded state. In such a simple world, the probability, the amount of proteins that have not yet folded is going to go down exponentially. So that's the probability starts at 1, and then it goes down as exponentially, will eventually reach 0. This tau is the time constant. We have, for now, we have no idea about how fast that is. And that also means that the probability of protein that's going to fold, that's going to be 1 minus that exponential. So you start out not having folded any protein, and then you gradually go up 
and then eventually, as most proteins have folded, this rate is going to start decreasing. This is true. This has nothing to do with protein folding. This is what you call a first order reaction or a simple two state transition. And that's, if you don't know anything else about a chemical process, that's usually what you start assuming. That leads to some profound things that surprisingly took us a very long time to realize. Even though we don't know what that tau is, let's start to take an arbitrary protein like the one I showed here and assume that it's a two-state model. I can't do that because I haven't proved it, right? Or can I? Still can, but you have nothing to compare it to. Well, so that's kind of a problem, right? That first, never ever be afraid of simplifying and guessing. The key thing that this is probably among the simplest proteins we can have. What we can of course do, we can assume that this holds and let's see, let, does this A lead to reasonable things? And at some point we're eventually going to need to compare this to experiments to see if the model is right. But if we want to understand folding, it doesn't get any simpler than this. And you could here of course imagine that this is a molten globular, this is some sort of transition and this is a really folded state. So let's just assume that and see what happens. Uh, in particular, complicated diagram here. Forget about it. Let's just look at this diagram. I should put this in white background instead. The red line here is 1 minus an exponential as a function of time. And here you actually, this goes out to 50 microseconds. So this is this protein BBA5, which is a small designed protein. It's designed to be super stable by the Barbara Imperiali group at, uh, I think it's Berkeley. It's a really complicated name. It's a beta, beta, alpha. That's why it's called BBA. Can you imagine why it's number five? Kind of the fifth mutant they tried, right? Uh, so they probably made mistakes at least four times before they found something that was stable and folded really fast. But the, so this is a protein where we know that the experimental folding rate is roughly, a folding time is in the ballpark of 10 microseconds. So this tau is roughly 10 microseconds. And again, that's because we can measure it experimentally. How much protein has folded? And that's exactly the, the proportional or the probability of the being folded. So the beautiful thing is that if you could just go upstairs in the lab this afternoon and run a 50 microsecond simulation of this in water, you should fold it. Actually, you don't need, you could argue that you don't need 50 microseconds, right? The folding time is just 10 microseconds. What would happen if you run a 10 microsecond simulation of this protein? No, you would be there, right? So the probability would be roughly two thirds. So in one third of the cases, you still wouldn't have seen it fold and it would be completely in agreement with experiments. And a 10 microsecond, that's a pretty darn long simulation. You're running simulations in the nanosecond range. But you know what? If this is a simple first order reaction, all we're saying that in terms of being first order reaction, there's just a single barrier. And whether things happen is really going to be related to whether we get enough energy to go over that barrier. So if you, the problem here is that if we then start to look into very, very small numbers here, the probability, if you just plot this from zero to 10 nanoseconds, the red line is virtually linear here, right? So the probability of folding in 10 nanoseconds, it's going to be like, 10 to the minus 3. The 10 microsecond was roughly 1. The 10 to the minus 1,000 times shorter simulation is roughly 1,000 times smaller probability. Now, how many of you would run a simulation if it's only one chance in 1,000 that the protein would fold? That's not worth it, right? That's essentially a zero. But it's only essentially a zero. It's not exactly a zero. So if you take this very small number, 0 0.001, and now you perform 10,000 such simulations instead. How many folding events do you expect to see? 10. 10,000 10, multiplied by 1,000, right? So the expectation value over 10,000 runs is to see 10 folding simulations. And that's essentially what we and others have done. Uh, oh, sorry. That's why you see on these uh, folding at home. So that is one, we actually had 10,000 simulations. This, this is one of them that folded. The problem is, of course, that of those 10,000, 9,990 did not fold. 
but we can still, since we can identify the proteins that do fold because we know what the folded state is, it's a beautiful way to look at folding statistics. And what I, what I say, what I mean when I say that this is a bit embarrassing, this is not exactly new physics or chemistry, right? This has been known for a hundred years. It's just that we haven't really been used to thinking of protein folding that way. The book doesn't do it either. So this is something that came using these statistical approaches, something that came pretty much the last 15 years. And this has been the driving force between some very large computing projects. Um, do you know what this is? That's a chip. That's actually a fairly old chip by now, but that's a graphics processor. Uh, graphics processors are very different from normal computing chips, uh, but they are insanely good at high throughput. You have this type of chips in lots of, well, game consoles. Uh, you certainly have them in modern graphics cards, and that is so not a modern graphics card anymore. So what people, we and others, started to do at Stanford some 15 years ago is realize that the traditional way of running a simulation, and you might have done it too, is run in parallel or get a larger supercomputer. The only problem, the largest supercomputer in Sweden only has in the ballpark of 60, 70,000 processors, processor cores even. And then it's going to be very hard because if you make a longer simulation, you're going to need to take shorter and shorter and shorter, uh, well, wall clock times between your steps. And it's simply a problem you can't solve. So what my colleague Vijay in particular had the idea is to run these as screensavers over not just one or 10 or 100 computers, but do it over hundreds of thousands of computers, first in the US and then all over the world. And the idea is that this is how we could collect 10,000 simulations for months. Even that, even that early project, 10,000 simulations and it would need it three months, that would be now one fifth of the supercomputer at KTH for three months for one project. That's, they would never give me that much time. Actually they might, but only once. And this project is now up to roughly half a million to one million clients. So that has gone down a bit uh, for complicated reasons, but for a while the aggregated computer power we had in folding at home was equivalent to the 10 largest supercomputers in the world together. And there have been some insane uh, contributors that have built these entire racks filled with GPUs and computers just to help us fold. So it's, in one way it's a horrible way of doing it, not necessarily large and fancy simulations, but lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of very tiny small simulations. And the funny thing is that enables us to study many of these concepts we talked about. For instance, this fold fraction and whether simple folding is a first order reaction. You know what? I know what the folded state is, so I can plot this a function of these simulations on average. Average time, and then I've averaged this over 10,000 simulations. How many simulations have folded? And this is like 0 0%, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0.6. So the bad thing is that initially nothing has folded. And then eventually this rate starts to go up a bit. It fluctuates heavily. So the point here is that it's not really a first order reaction. Had this been a first order reaction, we should start at zero and go straight up, right? As an approximation of the exponential. And it appears to be some sort of time that it takes at least 10 nanoseconds for anything to fold. And that's probably the time it takes to actually go over the barrier. That is to say, atoms do not move infinitely fast. So you could say, friend of order could say that, okay, it's not a first order reaction, forget about it. But the cool thing is that apart from that time, after that, it is, works fairly well with the linear approximation. Certainly not 99.9% .9 accuracy here, but it does really seem to be, apart from the time that it's a finite process, the slope here is in the ballpark of five microseconds. And experimentally, we're talking about six to seven microsecond folding rates. That's certainly true. You could, of course, argue that it's some at, at very, very large times it's something completely different. It's just that based on what we see, this ex does explain the folding rate, right? So that it might, five versus seven does not ma uh, sound like a uh, great fit. But we're talking about exponential dependencies. Only having a 20 to 30% error in something, this corresponds to an error in the barrier of, well, in the ballpark. Remember, what, if you make an error in the ballpark of KT, you're making a factor three error roughly. So that this corresponds to having an error in the folding barrier that is much smaller than KT. So it's, we have data, this data appears to explain the experimental results. That doesn't mean that something completely strange and magic could happen on much longer timescales, but we haven't seen that. And this would explain the experiments. But 
You can't prove that. You can't prove that. You, you could, of course, you could have, ma again, magic could have happened here. After, after one microsecond, things started to unfold, and then they would refold or something, right? But that comes back to Occam's razor, that this is the simplest model you can imagine. The simplest model you can imagine when we simulate that, that does indeed lead to folding rates that corresponds exactly to the experiment. So there is no, unless we have other evidence, there is no particular reason to believe that we have some more complex model. You could, of course, imagine that this was not a full first order reaction at all, and then this would not fit at all. But everything we can see in the simulations point to the fact that, at least for small proteins, crossing this barrier from a molten globular to a native state is well described by a first order model. And there, is no, there are no bonuses for getting more complicated models, unless you need them. The reason why I'm showing this is, <coughs> uh, yes, um, there might be some scientists that you know that were involved in these projects, but this is not just to push, push our own research. Uh, what I love with these simulations is that rather than having the book hand-waving about it, we can actually check some things. And this is something for Sarah to look at. Probabilities of helices and sheet. So this is the probability, I think we've, this is over the simulation. And then I've taken each cross here corresponds to a frame or something. So that is the probability of having both the helix and a sheet in a frame. And this is the probability of having the helix in that frame multiplied by the probability of having the sheet. Does this tell you anything? I'm not sure how much mathematical statistics you've taken. They're not just proportional, right? They're identical even, um, because the 0.3, the slope is one. So when the probability of a pair of events is proportional to the product, oh, sorry, is identical to the product of the events, what does that mean? They're independent. They're independent. So the probability of having the helix is completely independent of the probability of having the sheet and vice versa. The helix doesn't care if the sheet has formed and the sheet doesn't care if the helix has formed. Because if they depended on the other, this probability would be more complicated than the, just the product of the individual probabilities, right? Because they're like equal. No, well, yes, because that the probability of the helix and sheet is equal to the probability of having the helix multiplied by the probability of having the sheet. And this tells you something about the folding models. So what type of folding model is this? Mm -hmm. um, well, this would be the diffusion one, right? Right. So this is a, a protein diffusion collision. And this is what's so beautiful with the simulator. Rather than arguing that some small proteins might undergo this, we see it. It is diffusion collision. It's a perfect diffusion collision model, which is a bit of a bummer in a sense, because it's not really, doesn't seem to be representative of these larger proteins, but it's, it's a very small one. Uh, you can actually use this, this is not the main part of it, but you can actually use this for studying more complicated things. The, one of the reasons why we first started studying this protein is we want to understand when a protein folds, would a protein fold in vacuum in general? No. no. So the water is kind of important, at least to have as a hydrophilic environment, right? But then you could argue when you're on your way to, when you're on your way to folding, the structure of the protein, of course, matters. But all your water has oriented around the protein. Is the structure of the water important? Well, it's not an entirely easy question, right? Because you can certainly imagine water forming hydrogen bonds or something. Is there some, does the hydration shell that we showed that was so important in the hydrophobic effect, is there any role whatsoever in the water in the protein folding? And that's, again, something that we can check. So you can take each of these structures, you rip out the solvent, and you add new water in random orientation. And same thing here, that it turns out that the probability of continuing to fold is exactly the same that it was. So only the protein structure appears to matter for the folding, not the water at all. The water is merely a passive medium. Is the new solvent also similar to? No, so what you do is that this has to do with the things that you do in simulations too, right? So that you can remove all the Water, uh, water molecules, and then we add in new water molecules exactly the same way you did in the simulation. Um, and of course, these water molecules will adapt a little bit to the protein, but if there was any sort of special arrangement in the old solvent layers, we would have destroyed it. And this doesn't appear to affect the density significantly. Again, this is just for one small protein, so these are not general results. Uh, but these are things that have been this far, at least, they've been virtually impossible to probe experimentally. 
So at least for this simple protein, water does not seem to play an active structural role in protein folding. It plays a role for hydrophobicity, hydrophobic interactions. And the final thing that this enables us to do, remember the hand waving that I said that the last step is really the water leaving the building? <laughs> and we can do this. This is a bit of a complicated plot because we had lots of folding trajectories, right? And they fold at different times, so I can't average them all. But if I have some sort of folding criteria, that is, for instance, that the arm is D to the protein, if I then take my different trajectories and then I slide them and then I change the time scale, so this is exactly the point where all my simulations where I consider them that they have folded. And then it turns out that the first thing that happens here is that the radius of gyration of the core goes down. It might actually see that it goes up here, but all these things have completely different y scales. So I've just said that one corresponds to the value in the folded state and zero in the unfolded state. So what first happens is that the radius of gyration on the core approaches the value it should have in the folded state, and the RMSD, the atom coordinates, approach the value in the folded state. And the last thing that happens roughly one or two or three nanoseconds after that is really that the solvent density in the core goes down. So for this small protein, the last thing that happens to folding is that the water leaves. And when the water has left the hydrophobic core, then we're really stable in the folded state. Now, of course, this is just one protein. It's not uni uh, universally true and everything, but that's an example of how fairly simple computer simulations can teach us a lot about, not necessarily teach us a lot, but we can see that these simple hand-waving or paper and pen arguments actually hold in practice, at least for simple proteins. Just yes? Check. Uh, this is kind of an arbitrary, like, set the folding Yeah, so, so the problem here is that RMSD, that would be measured in angstroms, right? Radius of gyration would technically also be measured in angstrom, but those are completely different scales. And RMSD might go from, say, 5 down to, say, 2 or 3 or 1. The radius of gyration would maybe go from 30 to, whatever, 10. So there is, they would have completely different scales. There would be a completely different Y scales too. The solvent density, this is a density. This is not something that you could plot in the same scale even. So you would end up with a super complicated three different plots that some things go up and something go down. So what you typically do in these cases, I don't really care what the specific RMSD is. I don't care what the specific radius of gyration is. And then you typically rescale them so that the value they have in one end, unfolded, is zero. And the value you had in the other end is one. And then it's only a matter how quickly do they go from zero to one. So that's, and the other, had this been different plots, I bet we wouldn't be able to say that this difference is statistically significant, but we actually could show that it was. Um, if the RMSD is measuring uh, compared to the average, also the so the, the RMSD here is measured in, in each frame. What is the value relative to the, fold, the known experimentally folded state? Exactly, because that, uh, but, but that's a really important question. If we had not known what this state was, there is no way this would have worked. Why? So the problem is, right, that we started with 10,000 simulations, only 10 of them folded. And how can you say which, one, which 10 ones have folded if you don't know what the folded state was? Which is of course nice in a way that it enables us to study the protein folding. It's a horrible letdown in another way. We could never use this way to fold the protein if we don't know what the folded state is. Bummer, right? Major bummer. I will come back and talk about that tomorrow. There are some really cool techniques. Initially, we had some hopes that we should be able to detect changes in heat capacity or something. If you remember the book, when you undergo a phase transition, there is always a change in heat capacity. It didn't work. Uh, but there are some way cooler ways to study this. Um, but I'll come back to that later. But the key thing here is that we can at least study some things about how fast things happen. At least for simple proteins, it appears that we can approximate this really complicated folding transition by having a multiglobular state, there is a free energy barrier, and then we go down on the other side of the free energy barrier. Now, that's not always the case. There are some things... Because again, friend of order would certainly say that this is not going to be true for larger proteins. But even for a larger protein, we could hope that to first approximation, there is at least one barrier that's going to be larger than the other ones. So even if it's more complicated in practice, we can usually approximate it that way. 
And then if we don't know exactly what the folded state is, the other alternative is rather than doing this in simulation, we can of course try to do this experimentally, right? Um, and experimentally we should just see that as a function of time, in this case is for instance fluorescence or something. So this is a folding time that goes from 0 to 500 milliseconds. And then you have a curve here that describes a fraction from 0 to 1. This could, for instance, be the fluorescence of a protein that has autofluorescence. There are a bunch of techniques that you can use. 500 millisecond is a, well, reasonably fast, but not super fast. There are a bunch of very special techniques, for instance, stopped flow kinetics that you push into syringes so that you mix something and then a reaction starts to happen. And then you can measure the fluorescence in this um, test tube and even you can even have a very long tube here because if the flow continues in the tube if you keep measuring very close to the mixer the molecules that are flowing here they would only have had time to mix for a millisecond or something if you measure very far out you will measure molecules that have had time to mix for maybe 100 milliseconds it's complicated because they can use quite a lot of protein because you have to keep pushing but the whole point there are experimental techniques to study how things happen very quickly the only problem is that all these techniques, they just measure where things have folded. If this was an intermediate state, we might be able to measure the intermediate states, but they do not measure the transition state. And what you really would like to get, this is a protein they have in the book, I forgot what it's called, uh, Chi, I think, uh, Luis Serrano. So complicated protein. And what, did, what we are interested in, if this is now is some sort of nucleation condensation model, we would somehow be interested, can we identify some sort of core residues here that really are the first ones that start to fold? And all these techniques are completely useless. They will only tell us about stable states. What we're really after is the transition state. So rather than going home, we're going to try to get to that. Um, so there's going to be a tiny amount of mathematics here, but less than you think and it's not that difficult. So the first thing, if we want to understand anything that has to do with rates, it's no longer just about equilibrium and thermodynamics. We're really going to need to study how fast reactions happen. And when it comes to understanding how fast reactions happen, we talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Um, there are lots of fancy names for this chemical transition state theory and everything. But this is really based, you have one state A, you have another state B, and you have some sort of barrier F-sharp or something between them. And the speed of going from A to B is proportional to the, how high this barrier is, and the exponential of it. And the, uh, the speed, the rate of going from B to A has to do with the barrier from B, sorry, has to do with the difference in Difference in free energy between the barrier peak and state B. Do you remember that? We have no idea what these constants K0 are for now, but we don't really care about it. But that means that, oh, this is a complicated reaction, but if you take this reaction, if you, say, if you take these, sta these constants, we can measure experimentally. If we can just measure how fast something happens, for instance, in this plot, right, how fast does the actual folding happen, that we can measure. So if I, take the, if I measure those constants and then I take the logarithm of it, then I'm going to say that the logarithm of k is proportional to the difference in free energy divided by 1 divided by rt. So there's a 1 over t there, proportionality. So if I plot the logarithm of k versus 1 over t, I should be able to get these free energies as the slope. And that's called an Arrhenius plot way older than protein folding. Uh, very, very simple and famous concept in chemistry. So this is a temperature scale, one over temperature, which means that this is low temperature and that is high temperature. And then the logarithm of a rate constant. I bet you've seen plots like this, at least if you're taking chemistry, but you usually don't see plots with two lines in them. You usually see plots with one line in them. So if you just for a second look at the red one here. So what the red one says here is that this happens to be how you fast you go from native to the unfolded state. And at very high temperature, this happens fast. And as the temperature goes down, it's slower and slower and slower. That is completely normal. That's how most chemical reactions work, right? 
If you don't know anything about a chemical reaction and you would like it to happen faster, what can you usually do? Increase the temperature. That's always a good bet. But if you look at the blue line, what does the blue line mean? Right. Do you know any chemical reactions like that? They're not very common, right? So this is a chemical reaction that goes faster the lower the temperature is. Well, they do happen, but it's, again, it's not common. It's very counterintuitive. The only other problem is that these are not two independent reactions. If you go from native to unfolded, well, now you're in an unfolded state, so there is also a probability that you will go back from unfolded to native. And in particular, if you're sitting right in the middle, right at this temperature, the net effect is going to be, well, most experiments would tell you that nothing happens. Because you have exactly the same rate of folding as the rate of unfolding, right? And that's going to be pretty hard to measure. So if you're sitting at this, you're not going to measure anything. Nothing in the system changes here which makes it very, very hard to measure. Does that just mean you're going sort of in an equilibrium between... Exactly, that things go both left and right. Um, and it's not just that, even if you are at one of these positions, here the blue curve is gonna be higher than the red one. But of course, if you measure what virtually any experiment is gonna measure, it was is the total fraction of the folded state and what is the total fraction of the unfolded state. There are very few experiments that are able to measure these two concentrations independently. So in particular for protein folding, our genius plots are complicated. It's really hard to come up with good experiments that measures only folding but not back, uh, back unfolding or only unfolding but not refolding. It can, it is possible to design it, but it's, it's a pain. So it's going to turn out that we frequently try to avoid this. But for a second, let's assume that we could get this. In some cases we can get it. What does this give us? Folding ah. rates. Yes. What can you do with folding rates? You can try and determine the energy barriers. Good answer. Good answer. So that either, either you thought about this or you read up on it, and it doesn't really matter. Um, Whenever you go through something complicated, keep going back and realize, so let's see, why am I doing this? If you don't know why you're doing it, there's no way you're going to understand why we're doing it. Uh, and any type of complicated derivation, as, you've, as you're going to see on the next slide, we're going to try to derive an equation. If you don't really know what you're after, you're not going to get it. You can sit a month and play around with equations, but it's not going to help. So normally when you play around with equations, you need to somehow try to understand what we're after. And what we were after here is we want to understand, first we want to understand these barriers. We want to understand when folding happens and what type of barriers do we have at lower high temperature. So it's, a, it's somehow energies we want to get to. But the good news is that we can measure this K experimentally as a function of temperature. And once we can measure the K, we can also get the slope. And as we saw on the screen, the slope is related to this differences in free energy. And even more than that, we also have the temperature dependence, right? How that changes as a function of temperature. And how it changes as a function of temperature, that really does describe when does folding happen faster or slower. So this is a very common way to approach things. We have something that we can formulate it with an equation, as we did on the previous slide. But we can also measure the same thing experimentally. So then we can try to take this equation and see if we can study those things. This is not as hard as it, sounds, as it looks. So what we had in the previous plot is really we had the log, we, we know how this k changed as a function of uh, temperature, right? So we want to, and it's like we plotted the logarithm of it. So the slope of both those curves, red and blue, red and blue. The slope of those curves is really the derivative of that with respect to 1 over temperature. And again, this is not some fancy invention I had. We, had the, we plotted in the previous plot, we had the logarithm of k plotted against 1 over t. So literally, the slope is going to be that derivative. Why do you plot against 1 over t and not just t? Because 
k was proportional to an exponential of minus delta f divided by rt, right? Um, so had it been a t there and not a divided by t, if I take the logarithm of that, then I would get some constant I don't care about, plus minus something that's proportional to, and it's 1 over t there. So if I plot that as 1 over t, I'm going to get the difference in free energy divided by r as the slope. Otherwise, I would get a curve that goes as 1 over t. If I plot the t. Arrhenius came before this? How did he know to plot 1 over t? No, so that in that point, uh, no, of course, this was known already by Arrhenius. Uh, but Irenius didn't work on protein folding. This is true for any chemical reaction in general. But if we start, we know what the expression for that constant is. Um, so that k was proportional to k0 multiplied by an exponential, right? So if we take the logarithm of that, it's going to be the logarithm of the constant before it, which was k0. And then the logarithm of exponential that cancels out. So this is the argument that we had in the exponential. Minus f sharp, the barrier divided by f in the original state, divided by rt. And the derivative of 1 over t, well, that's t raised to the power of minus 1, right? That's 1 divided by t squared minus dt. Simple mathematics, although you might need to refresh it a bit. The first approximation, this constant doesn't really depend on a whole lot of temperature. If you don't trust me there, go and look up what Swanderinius wrote some hundred years ago for what he got the Nobel Prize. And then you get these really complicated expressions. So what is the log, what is the derivative of these free energies with respect to temperature and everything? And you know what? If I just had seen that, if I was not teaching this course, it would probably have taken me several days to come up with. And this is what I said that you, talk about, you need to know what we're after, right? If you don't know what you're after, I could have spent a month looking up one equation after the other and I wouldn't know what to get. But the point is, if you're somewhere in the back of your mind, it's so else I was trying to relate this to something we can measure, like an energy or something. And then you start, either you start playing around with the equations or you start digging up what we have seen before. Um, so there were some chapters early on in the book where we, just for fun, you started to look at how does the free energy vary with respect to temperatures and derivatives. And one of those equations the book actually came up to was this. When the book originally brought up this, this was just a curious fact. That the derivative of the free energy divided by temperature with respect to temperature is minus the energy divided by t squared. Really obvious result, right? Not. But suddenly you're standing here and saying, you know what, we need to express this derivative in terms of an energy. And this is exactly what that derivation would have given us. But again, I bet this would have taken me a week to come up with. But if you don't know that you were looking of converting this derivative to the energy, it would have taken you a year, at least, if you could ever do it. So if we assume that that part does not vary with respect to temperature, all this stuff actually simplifies that this derivative is roughly the energy barrier. Not the free energy barrier anymore, but the difference is energy of the transition state minus my original state, and then divided by r. So if you go back and think about the Arrhenius diagram now for a second, so that the derivative corresponds to the difference in energy. Is the derivative positive or negative? Well, that depends on what reaction we were looking at, right? So the unfolding rate grows with t as a normal reaction, but the folding rate drops with t. So if we start looking at this, on the one hand we know that the energy of the transition state must be higher than the energy of the native state. That has to do with the unfolding. But the fact that the folding rate drops with t, that goes in the other direction. That actually means that the energy of the transition state, on the other hand, is lower than the unfolded state. So this is a bit strange, so that we have something, you have a completely unfolded state that has very high energy, you have the transition state that has an intermediate energy, and you have a native state that has an even lower energy. So in terms of energy, there is no barrier whatsoever. It's all downhill, straight downhill. And we know that, because otherwise we would not have seen these Arrhenius plot with the two different slopes. 
And then it turns out you can do exactly the same thing, but express this in terms of entropies instead. That's a bit longer derivation. I even think the book skips it. There's absolutely no point in doing it. So here, you will just have to trust me that you can do exactly the same thing for entropy and show that the entropy is also highest in the unfolded state. It drops when you go to the transition state and it drops even more when you go to the native state. And this is no longer based on hand waving or anything, but this is based on the reaction rates we see in Arrhenius plots. So for any normal reaction, again, if we forget about proteins for a second, for normal molecules, we would expect the reaction in both directions to go faster as the temperature goes up. And in that case, you really would have had the transition state be special both in terms, sorry, this state be special both in terms of enthalpy and entropy. But the special thing with protein folding is that it, we have this, both the enthalpy and the entropy go down when we go to the native state. Which in particular will, hey, if you're going from the native to the denatured state, entropy-wise, that's going to be great. So the only reason this does not happen instantaneously must be that there's an, I should have written enthalpy there, but there must be that the energy barrier is even higher, enthalpy. And same thing when we're, fold, when we're folding, we're going from denatured to the native state. Well, en enthalpy-wise, it's downhill. That should be good, instantaneous. It doesn't happen instantaneously. And that means that there must be a barrier with just the other component, i.e. entropy. Not hand waving, it's based on the Arrhenius plots. This is likely a good place to take a break. Uh, but do you follow what this means for proteins? Can I just sure. No, both happen in proteins all the time. Uh, which one is most dominant? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, we should take a, we'll take a break here in a minute, but both happens all the time. Depending on the temperature, one of them will dominate more than the other. But at any normal temperature, you will always have some protein molecules unfolding, even if 99% of them folds. So on average, at equilibrium, the total amount of proteins unfolding and the total amount of molecules folding is going to be the same. But you always have both pro processes happening because there are finite energy barriers between them. Now, in terms, we frequently talk about protein folding, but protein folding and protein unfolding is really the same thing, right? We want to understand what is that makes it stable in one direction and what is that makes it stable or non not stable in the other direction. So if you just want to understand how quick folding happens, then you could argue that it's just important to look at the blue curve. But that would not help you if the unfolding was also so fast that everything you could fold instantly unfolded. So for, for the proteins to actually stay folded, first we have to fold them, but then it has to be slow for them to unfold. So it's not enough that they fold fast. It has to be better to stay folded. This is a great place for a break. And after the question, we'll, uh, sorry, after the break, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, curves like this and trying to reason what's really happening here, why this gives rise to specific barriers and how we can use this to interpret things. The take home message that you can think more about is really that F is a balance between enthalpy and entropy, which is going to complicate some things but also solve things for, for us. It is. 10.35. Should we meet here at 11? Let's get started again. So where we were before the break is that we went through all those equations, studied the enthalpy and the entropy, right? And what we came, if we forget about the equations and look at the shape of the curves, this is really what we arrived at. We can start at the denatured state, the transition state, and the native state. And this completely extreme uh, random coil state we don't really care about for now. So looking at these three dashed lines, what we could do with just by looking at the Arrhenius plot is to show that the energy goes, we start from denatured, it's lower in the transition state, but it must be even lower in the native state, simply based on the, on the rates of folding. Similar with entropy, it starts high, it goes down in the transition state, and it goes down even more in the folded state. 
And what happens here, you, if you, you can think of these two uh, curves as uh, two parts, right? So you have one part here that's roughly linear, and then you have some higher order term. But the whole point is that depending on the temperature, the linear parts will usually cancel each other. So that the fact that both of them go down, that just means that there is no significant difference in free energy. And that will mean that it's going to be these nonlinear parts in the particular the case that, uh, in the particular the fact that the entropy has a relatively sudden drop that will give rise to this barrier. And that's why we have one type of unfolding barrier and a second type of folding barrier. So the folding barrier happens here, which is mainly the entropy, while the unfolding barrier comes in the other way, and that's mainly where the energy starts, because the energy starts going up here quicker than the entropy goes up, while the enthalpy, sorry, while the entropy goes down quicker than the entropy goes down on this side of the barrier. Was all this shown before we knew about protein structure? Yes. Folding rates we can see before protein structure, but of course, then we weren't really sure what is a folded state, right? Do we know that there's a unique physical state? We had no idea about side chain packing and everything. It wasn't really until we got the first X-ray structures that we could talk about something, something folded in the sense that it really was one unique state we were reaching. Now it might seem obvious, but when Christian Amphis in particular started to study these cases, this was roughly at the same time where we also started to see that there really is one state. Because until the point you realize that there is one state, this is not an obvious question to ask how that state is stabilized. But there was one problem with this. And what was the problem with this? If you're going to measure, why don't we start measuring this for lots of proteins? No. It's because it, to first approximate, well, that's what we're going to see, right? We're going to see whether it holds out whether those lines are nice and beautiful and linear. The problem is that it's very hard to measure folding and unfolding rates in isolated. So the Arrhenius plots for a process that's complicated than this one, in particular where we frequently exist at the half point where they go roughly 50-50, the Arrhenius plots can be really hard to determine. So what, what you really, this might sound like a strange title, but if you have a real experiment, what you are measuring is not the rate of folding. You're basically measuring what is the rate of folding minus the rate of the unfolding, right? That is the apparent folding rate. How quickly do we appear to approach the equilibrium? If we start out with something that's not at equilibrium. And the book spends a little bit of time going through this. And I'll, I'll just show you the equations because it's a bit of a strange concept. Um, what we know is that if you look in terms of chemistry and uh, constants of equilibrium or something, the proportion of molecules in the B state relative to the number of molecules in the A state, that corresponds to how quickly molecules move from A to B divided by how quickly molecules move from B to A. That, in turn, because they're the rate constants, that is related to the differences in free energy between those two states. And the prefactor cancels out. And that's, again, this is just based on what we had in the last few slides when we said that how we express a rate constant. In particular, note that the transition state energy cancels out. Because this is just the, again, when we have equilibrium, what is the probability of the molecules being in each state? And you can also show that that corresponds to, at infinity, when we've actually reached equilibrium, how many molecules are in B versus how many molecules are in A. But note that this is true even when we're not at equilibrium. So can we do something with that? Well, the first thing we're interested in is some rate or something happening as a function of time. So let's start to study how quickly, say, the molecules in the A state change as a function of time. So the change in the number of molecules in the A state, well, that's going to correspond to, first, this will be reduced by the number of molecules leaving the A state, right? And the number of molecules leaving the A state is going to be the rate constant from A to B multiplied by the number of molecules we already have in A. But we're also going to gain molecules that move from B to our A state. And that's, again, the molecules in the B state multiplied by that rate constant. And A and B here, as you will probably realize in a second, is going to correspond to folded and unfolded. But now it's just two states in a simple chemical reaction.
Then there are a bunch of things you can do here. Um, so first, we don't really know what Na and Nb is, right? But we know that the sum of them must be some sort of N0. So that N0 is the total number of molecules. And N0, well, as a function of time, that's really constant. But that's going to be Na as a function of time plus Nb as a function of time. So that we can always take Nb and express that in terms of Na. And exact, well, there's a constant too, but that constant is not really a function of time. For now, we don't know. For now, we're just going to make, if we can formulate something that I, I would ideally like to something that's a, either just, a, I, ideally I would like to, so I would know what Ka to B is and K to B to A is. But for now on, consider this, are we playing a bit with the equations and see where we can get. We also know, if we then use that equation, we can say that the number of molecules in state A at infinite time multiplied by the K A to B is equal to the number of molecules B at infinite time K B to A. I'm using the fact that that is equal to that. So k a to b multiplied by a at infinity is b at infinity multiplied by b to a. And then as a special case of that one, I also know that n0 at infinity is n a at infinity plus n b at infinity. If I take all that and insert that in that equation, I get that n0. K B to A equals N A at infinity multiplied by K A to B plus K B to A. This is not just of numbers. I'll show you where this leads us to. Um, we don't really care what n0 is. We don't really care what kb is. But the point we can express is that na, the sum coordinates, is constant multiplied by both of these numbers. That means that this equation, all the stuff that we have here on the right side, simplifies to a sum of two constants multiplied as something that only contains na. So what I got here is I got rid of the molecule concentration in NB. So now I have something that says, how does the number of molecules in state A vary as a function of some, this is just a big constant, multiplied by something that only depends on state A. Does this look complicated? So many of these equations end up looking complicated because we have lots of things in them. But all what we're really saying here, if you this is a constant. So some derivative of something, Na, is minus sign, but forget about that. So it's a constant multiplied by Na itself. So we come back to this, a function that it's its own derivative, which is what? The exponential, right? So if we integrate this, we say that Na is, again, lots of constant. Forget about what that constant is for now multiplied by the exponential of that factor. And then another constant we don't really care about. But the neat thing is that here we're only looking at one state. And this is how the number of molecules in this state changes as a function of time in total. And it turns out that the equilibrium constant there is actually the sum of the forward and backward constant. So that sort of apparent rate for how fast the tolling happens in total is the sum. This looks really crazy. Why is that? A rate constant can't really be the sum of both the backward and forward, right? Doesn't that kind of what we said at the beginning? It is. Um, it would be very easy to think that it's going to be a difference, but that has to, this has to do with logarithm laws and uh, how we set them up. You do not have to know this derivation. It's not advanced mathematics. If you want to, I think the book goes through it in even more detail. The key thing is that we can express 
some sort of apparent constant as a sum of these two. The neat thing with this apparent constant is that this is not depending on just going forward or just going backward. For a complicated reaction that goes in both ways, this apparent constant determines how much, for instance, of either the folded or unfolded state we see. So now we have a way to express, uh, we, we don't have to measure folding separately from unfolding. I can do all any of my fluorescence experiments, I said, how much folded protein do I have as a function of time? Or conversely, how much unfolded protein do I have as a function of time? The second you can measure that experimentally with any technique, we know what this apparent folding rate is, because we see how quickly that changes as a function of time. There are like a dozen different experiments we can do to measure this. Fluorescence is a simple one. Secondary structure constants might be another one, although it's probably hard. Any, any time you can do something with stopped flow or measure something with a laser or something, you can get time resolution in these things down to microseconds, a shorter even that. And this leads to two plots that a couple of you probably recognize. Chevron plots. How many of you have heard about it? Some of you think by physics. Um, this is not as complicated as it looks. Rather, it is in a way. This is more complicated than those very simple Arrhenius plots but they're way easier to measure. So that we have something that we're changing. In this case, it's a concentration of a denaturant, say guanidinium hydrochloride. And this is my observed rate. How quickly is the reaction happening? And so here we have something that measures, say, folding. And here we have the process measuring unfolding. So the whole, oops, the whole part is I'm just measuring how quickly a reaction happens. I don't really care whether it's the forward or backward reaction. So when we're measuring how quickly we're unfolding something, well, I can keep adding denaturant and I can measure how quickly, say, the fluorescence decays or something. The more denaturant I have, the, the more denaturant I have, the faster I'm going to unfold. So then the speed of this reaction goes up. But as if we do the opposite instead, and if I start to diluting the solution, so I dilute it more and more and more and more, then I'm going to fold faster and faster and faster. I'm going to see that we get more and more safe fluorescence or something. So the whole complication or trick here is really just that we plot these in the same plot. And what then happens is that you're going to get one very clear line here. And the reason why this line is so clear is that you see that it's a logarithmic scale. So that this is 10 to the power of 3. The unfolding is 10 to the power of minus 5. If you subtract 10 to the minus 5 from 10 to the power of 1 or so, that, that point is not going to change. And it's the same thing up here. When one process is much faster than the other, it's not going to influence it. But right here in the crossover point, here you can have a, some molecules that fold and some molecules that unfold. So the total aggregated rate here is going to be slightly higher. Here you really see that it's the sum of the two constants. The only reason for doing this is that it's easier to measure. It's harder to understand than the Arrhenius plot, but understanding is something you only have to do once. Once you've understood it once, you can just keep measuring this in the lab and get a factor of 1,000 more data than you can get with Arrhenius plots. Okay. Yes? The difference between these Chevron plots and the Arrhenius plots is the axis? Yes, a completely different axes. So here I'm just... So the problem with, with the Arrhenius plots, I had to measure things as a function of temperature because I was measuring one reaction in particular. Here I just pick a completely arbitrary, say, 6 molar guanidinium hydrochloride. And then I measure how quickly does, in that case, primarily an unfolding reaction happen. And I just measure the speed of the reaction. I don't care about what reaction it is, whether it's going backward or forward. So it's like the whole point is that this is easier to get to in the lab. For now, you don't know what this curve tells you. Or at least I wouldn't know that. Is it obvious to, obviously you have something that tells you that there is some reaction happening and here you're going very much going in the folded direction and there you're going very much in the unfolded direction. But it's so not obvious to you how to use this, right? I don't expect it to be at least. These are called Chevron plots because of these characteristic patterns of military jackets. Um, they're strange the first time you see it. The second part, you will never ever see a plot like that. You're going to see a diagram with this, like with a dozen plots in it. And we'll see that in a second, why you do that, a dozen plots. So remember, remind me again, why are we doing this and what are we really after? Trying to get transition state energy. Yes. So we started, we started with the, um, 
Arrhenius plots, and that helped us to understand how high is the energy versus the entropy. And then we could just see that the energy was going down, but the entropy was also going down. And we still really haven't been able to capture the transition state, and in particular, we haven't found any good way to measure the transition state in the lab. This will be just a little bit complicated, but the beauty of these plots is that it helps us to capture the transition states. So why can't you just capture the transition state directly and measure it? Right, the molecule will never spend any time in the transition state, right? So I can never measure a property of the transition state directly. Let's have a look at this. Um, rather, you know what, let's go back to this. With this, assuming that this, you pick your protein X, whatever X is, and you measure this curve, how, how quickly does protein X fold or unfold, for instance, as a concentration of denat your denaturant. This is the wild type of the protein. You get one curve like this for the protein. But we are interested in studying this transition state, in particular if we can find one of these five, six, maybe ten residues that is really part of the transition state. So, of course, to some extent this measures the folding part here. That's going to measure how quickly we get over the transition barrier, the entropic part, right, when we fold. And this unfolding part is going to measure how quickly do you go from the native state to the denatured state. So both of these branches are going to measure how easy it is to fold versus unfold. In general, if we change something in the protein, for instance, if I mutate a leucine to an alanine, the position of these branches will move around a bit. It might be easier to fold or it might be easier to unfold. So typically, a fluorescence is one great example. Um, you can anything you can measure that is somehow a simpler property because I don't I don't really want to know what, exactly what the structure is. I just want to know that there is some sort of structure. Anything that's functionally related to the protein will work fine too. In most cases, you don't need this to be time resolved. Uh, I just need to measure how quickly does it fold. So you see it is functional. Yes. So this is a picture taken from the book. Green here is the wild type. And then let's assume that we just make a mutant here, and that's the red curve. So to see, the curve has moved a bit, both in the X and Y. So what we really want to do is, you know, can I say for a given residue, whether is this residue part of the transition state or not? And the easiest thing to do that, well, the only way I can do that, I kind of need to see if it changes things, right? So what we have on the y scale here is the logarithm of this rate constant. And uh, we know that that is, well, it's not equal. There should be a proportionality sign there. The rate constant has to do with the free energy differences divided by RT. So if something happens faster, it's because the free energy barrier is lower, right? So let's just, for argument's sake, let's say that I mutate residue number 29. And then realize when I mutate residue 29, the folding process goes much faster. So you know that this is the one transition. Well, so that's, that's my question to you. What can we say about that? There's some amino acids, right, that you say is transition. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem with this is that we can't necessarily say a whole lot about that because instant, instinctively it feels obvious, right? Well, if the, if the folding process goes faster, I've stabilized something, that should be awesome. That means that this must be part of the transition state. But I might just have changed something that was only bad, that only affect, that was also stabilizing the entire folded state or destabilized the unfolded state. So just because something is better for the protein, that's not proof that it was part of the transition state. It just might have stabilized everything instead. So I somehow want to capture is how much do we stabilize the unfolded to native versus how much does it affect the other part, the native to unfolded transition. And it turns out that we can get both of these. Sorry? Yes. And this is not entirely easy. Mind. Here's the first one I'm going to throw up. Um, <laughs> if we are looking the na unfolded to native state, that corresponds to these two slopes, right? So I'm starting in the green, and when I mutate it, I move to the red. So this curve has moved down a bit. And the change in the difference 
So I'm, first I'm looking at what is the barrier. So the barrier corresponds to the, bar the free energy in the transition state minus the unfolded state, right? But I want to check how much, so that barrier is of course itself a difference, but now I want to check how much does this barrier change? Does it go up or down? And I'm going to argue that that's proportional to the RT times the logarithm. And the logarithm again is what we had on the Y scale here. Well, you're not used to seeing it in this form, right? But take the exponential of both sides. What I'm saying here is that the, the rate constant unfolded to native is proportional to an exponential of the difference in the barrier divided by RT, right? And that's the entire, that's just the definition of a rate constant. So this is not a complicated equation. We just took the rate constant definition and solved it for the free energy. The beautiful thing here is that R is just a constant temperature we know and the shift delta here. So I'm just saying, what is the difference in the logarithm? Well, the logarithm we already have on the Y scale. So that at this particular concentration, exactly how much did I move this curve down? That tells you how much the barrier from the unfolded to native state changed. That's pretty awesome, right? It's by no means obvious. So you have a really complicated plot that you're getting from an experiment. We're just measuring rate constants. That plot tells you how much the free energy barrier from the unfolded to native state changed. I can't say how high the barrier is. Saying that is much harder because that's an absolute number. But the difference I can say. The reason why I can't say how high it is in absolute terms, then I would have this prefactor, right? And I don't know what the prefactor in the rate equation is. But the diff in the difference, the prefactor cancels out. So I can say that if I make my, mutate my leucine to an alanine, directly from this plot, I can say how much the stable L, for instance, reduces the barrier. But the only problem here is that I've reduced this barrier. There is one of two things that can have happened. Either I dropped the energy in the, sorry, either I dropped the energy in the transition state or I increased the free energy in the unfolded state. Which is it? Increased in the folded state. Well, the folded state doesn't even enter here, right? We only have an unfolded and the transition state. So which was it? If this number dropped, is it because the free energy in the transition state went down or the free energy in the unfolded state went up? Exactly. We have absolutely no idea. And that's, of course, the problem, right? It's a beautiful definition that is completely useless. <laughs> because the problem, and, and that is why, why I can't say that this. It would of course be great to say that if I make a change here and if this energy dropped, it would be awesome if the free energy of the transition state dropped, I stabilized my transition state. And then by definition, this molecule must have been part of the transition state. But I can't say. It might just have been that my mutation could have destabilized the unfolded state instead. And then this residue absolutely wasn't part of the transition state. So it's not enough. What else do we need? So we need to compare this with the folded state, right? Um, we also need to see, to make sure that this was not just the fact that changing the unfolded state, I also need to compare what is the difference between the native state and the unfolded state. Because if this did not change, then the native versus unfolding was constant. And in that case, it was just the transition state I affected. But this is pretty much the same. So now I have a native versus unfolded. But I can use that equation again. If I go from unfolded to native, that is like going from unfolded to transition and then transition to native. Right? So I just end up with two, two equations like that. But one of them, the second one of them will have a minus sign. Because first I go from unfolded to transition states, that's the same, but then I'm going to go from transition state to native, and that's like minus going from native to transition state, right? So I end up with exactly the same thing, but I get two terms like that. <laughs>
And if you know your logarithm laws, you can even take those two logarithms and put them inside one expression. And the difference between two logarithms is the quotient between them. So the stability of the folded state relative to the unfolded state is, again, constant divided by the change in the ratio between these two. And actually, since I'm already plotting the logarithm, it's actually going to be that line. And it is just the difference between these two. So then we have the difference between, here we talk about native to, um, uh, sorry, um, native to unfolded states. So now I'm going to have what is the difference between that curve and the difference between that curve. So rather than just having a small difference, I end up with the larger one here. You're going to need to think about this a couple of minutes, I'm sure. Um, oh, sorry. We use that a lot. What, how on earth are we going to use this? Can we say something about that second part, like the difference between the native and the unfolded? So the whole trick here is right. It's going to be to compare these two, and I'm going to throw out a definition here. You call you introduce something called phi. So that we have the first one, the barrier unfolded to native, and then we divide that by the barrier, which is the stability of the folded state. So let's see what this, what this means. If, if we don't change the transition state at all, sorry, if this is roughly zero, that means that the difference between the transition state and the unfolded state is virtually zero, right? So that, that could, of course, have meant that I changed both the transition state and the unfolded state equally. But that's fine. But if I do, Because if I've done that, I haven't really either destabilized or stabilized the transition. So when phi is zero, whatever mutation I introduced is not going to change the transition state. On the other hand, if phi starts to be very high, so that this term, sorry, so it can only be one. If this term is roughly the same as the second term, what does that mean? Well, that means that the entire difference I introduced here was really a difference that shows up already in the transition state. So if the entire difference I did was in the transition state, this particular residue is going to be right in the middle of the transition state, right? Every single, because by definition, the transition state is when I start having the first few residues forming a core of the protein. If the entire difference in free energy I'm getting shows up already in the transition state, this molecule is to 100.0% in the transition state. If I get roughly, if this is 0 0.5, so 50%, well, whatever residue you had, 50% of the difference shows up already in the transition state and the rest in the really folded state. So this is a way that I can start to say for each residue, I need to do a mutation. But once I've done a mutation, I can say, for instance, my residue 29, is residue 29 really part of the transition state? This is really cool because we're measuring something you can't measure. You can't, you can't really measure the transition state. There is no way we can access the transition state directly. But by comparing the forward and the backwards barrier with these measures, I can actually come up with this number. Alan First, who introduced this, um, he's probably had like 100 students who spend their entire PhD doing curves like this. Uh, Alan is famous for a lot of things, but uh, there's in particular a very small protein called Barnase. Um, it's a bacterial ribonuclease, and that's what the name comes from, but it, it's, forget about that, that's not really right. This is a small fast-folding protein. Uh, it's very stable and it's actually very famous for forming interaction partners with an inhibitor called BARSTAR um, and this protein-protein interactions are remarkably stable. So it's a, it's a very, it's one of these toy proteins that, no not toy proteins, but it's a very very common protein for doing simple structural studies on. What Alan first did is that he introduced this so-called folding transition state analysis or so nowadays it's just called five value analysis because it's so extremely common. So what you can do with phi analysis, Alan's team, they basically taken every single residue in these proteins and pretty much mutated it to probably every single other residue you can imagine. And to try to determine 
that rest you for instance right there in the middle is this one part of the transition state is that one part of the transition state is that one part of the transition state is that one part of the transition state why do we do this I come back to that that's always the best question to ask yourself when there are difficult things So we want to study these folding models, right? And remember, both on Thursday last week and this, I kind of think, that, well, you know, nucle this nucleation condensation model that we talked about is going to turn out to be the one that describes protein best. And there are certainly some good hand-waving arguments for it, and even some of the physical arguments that I'm going to go through here shortly has turned out to be good in a hand-waving sense. But we haven't really showed, remember, even the simulations I showed you before the break, they appear to be more diffusion collision, right? But if the nucleation condensation model is true, we should be able to identify that there has to be some sort of nucleus that forms sooner than the other proteins, and that's going to be the transition state. So the idea of going after all this is that we really want to see, can we find, is there a nucleus? You could, of course, one possible outcome is that if you take a protein and mutate every residue, and the phi value of every single residue is pretty much zero, what would that mean? Right, this BBA5 protein that we worked, if it's a diffusion, simple diffusion collision first order model, the, uh, I would guess that all the five values are going to be zero or very close to zero. So if it's really, there is no real transition state that we have to stabilize. On the other hand, if you five, find 510 residues in a center, and remember, you could do this without actually knowing what your structure is, right? You could, in principle, do this already on the sequence level. It's going to be hard. If you have a large protein, it's going to be hard for you to identify what sequences to start to mutate, but you can do it. So even before you know the structure, you can say what residues should be part of some sort of folding nucleus. So the amount, if you actually, in the cases where we see proteins and some of these five values are much higher than others, then this is a very strong indication that this is a protein where you have a couple of key residues that need to be the pioneering residues that form the first folded core of the protein. I wouldn't mention this, of course, unless it worked. Um, and there are some really cool things. So that Alan, these are Alan first studies. They have been amazingly important. People have done simulations on them too. But the really cool part here is that when we start using this to ask questions that are pretty hard. Remember that we spoke about beta barrel membrane proteins? Or rather, I hardly spoke about them, right? Because I said, that, well, there are some beta sheet membrane proteins, but we kind of forget about them because they're so rare. The only problem is that we know that they don't fold through the translocum, but they somehow have to be inserted directly. So this is a paper a few years ago, I think it was 2009 or so, uh, why a bunch of research, they used 5 value analysis on uh, outer membrane pore proteins. So this is a beta sheet, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 sheets, I think. And then they have started taking this protein, residue one, two, three, four. Do you see how many mutants there are? There are mutants everywhere. And then you need to start making this. In this case, you have sort of concentration of urea here. And in this case, you have some absorbance or something. So here you don't see the role. Oh, well, sorry, here you have the chevron plots. So in this case, you're measuring a wavelength of absorption of maximum or something, and then you translate it into the chevron plots. And then you're going to have a ton of different chevron plots for all the different mutants. This is just a small snapshot of but in this case, you know roughly what the structure should be. So each and every one of these mutants, we can also map on the protein. And then we can start to define what is the folding nucleus. So here you can color things by the phi value. Whether they, So yellow here means that they stabilize the transition state. And red would actually mean that they destabilize the transition state. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail what that means right now. But it turns out that there are a couple of key interactions, a couple of beta sheet interactions that have to form first. That is hydrogen bond is important. These hydrogen bonds are important. And that really help this sheet. So you start at something coil and you're gradually moving into the membrane. You start to form a few key interactions and eventually you fold into the membrane. Yes. Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, so in principle, 
RNA folding is quite different from protein folding. In many cases, RNA folding is actually much, in many cases, actually easier to predict the structure of RNA than from proteins. Um, so on the one hand, RNA is much more floppy and flexible, but RNA structure is usually local structure. So this local secondary structure is really critical for RNA, while there are much fewer long-range interactions in RNA. Um, so in principle, you can do it. I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, and I'm not even sure whether, uh, oh, let's see. People have, people have certainly simulated RNA and RNA folding. I'm not sure whether there are a whole lot of experimental structure where people have looked at how fast RNA folds. Uh, it's an interesting question. We can look it up. But the main point here is that five value analysis and just studying these transition states enables us to understand some really complicated problems. There is no way we can study this in a computer simulation. It's too slow. There is no way we can study this in an experiment because we're never going to be able to capture these horrible transition states. And the only thing we know is it doesn't insert through the translocum. So most of our understanding of beta barrel membrane protein folding is really based on how these insert through five value analysis. Super simple biophysical technique. The only problem is that it, I remember once hearing a winter school where Alan was presenting, he's an amazing scientist, that does lots of really fun stuff. And then you see this plot and it's completely full of points. And then you start realizing that, I think he was talking about a recent PhD student, but you realize that that plot probably contained 20 PhD theses is worth the work. <laughs> so now there, well, some PhD projects were simply just about adding another 10 points in the plot. Uh, but that, of course, what, what it occasionally takes to prove a very large research problem. Alan could certainly be a Nobel Prize candidate. Um, these inventions might start to be a, a bit too old in the sense that they're obvious, but it's a remarkable advance in biophysics. But we have closer examples. Mikael Oliverberg, some of you have taken courses for him. Mikael, they work on protein misfolding. And Mikael is very interested in what is it that causes prone proteins to fold or misfold and the amount of charges on the surface. I'm not going to have time to go into details in his work. But what they have done, they've taken these simple proteins and then you start doing 5 value analysis. And in some cases, you find really beautiful folding nuclei. Um, so blue here means that the 5 value, virtually 1. And to prove this even cooler, you might not even be able to see the difference here. But so this is a beta sheet protein. But to really prove this folding, you can now do a circular permutation of it. So do you see here that the, no, you don't see it here, but the N and the C terminus here are very close to each other. But it's certainly not the case is to start folding in the N terminus and fold in the C terminus. You start folding in the middle. So what now if you do a circular rotation of all the residues so that you connect these N and C terminus to each other, and then we make the cut up here instead. So they have the N and C terminus here. It's a completely different protein sequence, right? So you take the first half of the sequence and put that at the end of the protein. And it falls to the same structure. And we can show that again with 5 value analysis. And again, this is just one paper that each and every point here is where you've measured a rate constant as a function of denaturant. And every curve is a new mutant. So there's an insane amount of work behind these studies. But it's cool because it enables us to see things that are not, it enables us to see things you can't see. I think that's all I'm going to say about five value analysis, but it's definitely, I you don't need to be able to re-derive those equations, but you should understand what this means in terms of stabilizing the transition state versus stabilizing the folded versus unfolded state. Not because you're necessarily going to become experts on five value analysis, but it really helps. If you understand that, you've understood a whole lot about the folding and unfolding processes. So with that, you should start to be in pretty good shape. Um, in principle, well, in principle, we don't understand anything, right? Because remember what I said last night, that we still have this problem with Amphensen versus Leventhal. Is it that the native state is the lowest free energy or the native state is the fastest folding? So all I did since last Thursday was really, you know what, forget about low free energy for a second. Let's look entirely at kinetics. And I cheated and you didn't. None of you read it, uh, found out. What I'm going to argue that this could really be both. Um, you will not be able to have a really fast folded protein unless the native state has a very low free energy. And you will not be able to have a native state that has a very clean lowest free energy that you actually can reach. Because if you can't reach it, it's a philosophical question whether it's a protein, unless it's a fast-folding one.
So there are some indications, both experimentally and theoretically actually, that stable structures will virtually always, not always, but virtually always lead to neat, nice, rapid pathways. And this is really going to be how Leventhal and Amfinsen, they say, they don't say the same things, but in practice, they're going to talk about the same structures. Stable proteins have low free energy. Virtually, it's virtually always the lowest free energy, the global free energy minimum. And that also means that they're the fast folding proteins. Can we solve that? Well, we still have Leventhal's problem, right? That Levin, if we don't know anything, that the time it takes for folding should take too long. And we know what this time is. Now we talk about time rather than rate constants, but they're equivalent. It's just a minus sign in the exponent. So the time is x goes up exponentially as the folding barrier, right? So what, if you should formulate Leventhal in another way, what is Leventhal saying? Simpler than that. Rather than saying something about time, what does Leventhal say about delta f? No, what, so if delta f was large, what would that mean? Oh, that the is high. Is it, if delta f is large for real proteins, the barrier would be high and real proteins would not fall. And that's obviously not the case, right? That's what he pointed out. So what Leventhal pointed out that in practice they do fold quickly. So what does Leventhal actually say about delta f? No, we don't know exactly why it's smaller than we would expect. But it's delta f is delta f tar pair is significantly smaller than we would expect from searching all states. So for some reason, we're going to need to find a way to explain why delta f is relatively low. Is delta f sharp from what's the difference? It's from the top of the peak to either side. Or? Well, that's when we're talking about in terms of Leventhal, he primarily talked about protein folding, right? It actually turns out that protein unfolding can be quite quick. So then in this case, it's delta F sharp would be from the transition barrier down to the unfolded state when we talk about folding. No. Uh, sorry, I should probably have that. So, and we also, you also know that, what is F? Well, F is this balance between enthalpy and entropy, right? So that somehow we're going to need to explain this, that they will need to go down by roughly the same speed. Because if one of them go down significantly quicker than the other, you're going to end up with a large difference. And that can't happen. So that the only way this can be small is that if enthalpy and entropy drops roughly at the same time. Which they kind of do, but there will, if they did drop in exactly the same rate, the difference would be zero. And it's not exactly zero. So. What Amfinsen said, and what, what we kind of assumed when we first studied this, is that, well, first you have the chain collapsing. And then when the chain has collapsed, you start forming all this side chain packing. That's what I said even at the beginning of this uh, lecture, right? That can't be true. Because if that is true, we will get a gigantic penalty from the difference in entropy from chain collapse. But we will not start gaining any energy until we packed it. So somehow we're going to need the chain collapsing, but you also need to start forming these contacts at the same time. Otherwise, it would be too costly. Do you see the analogy with nucleation condensation? We're going to need to start forming some good contacts early on, or it's going to be too costly. And this is this concept of folding funnels that both Leventhal and others started that there has to be some sort of pathway. Like think of this as a road be in the valleys between the mountains, there has to be some pathway that is reasonably guided where I don't pay a gigantic penalty in free energy, because otherwise it could never happen. You can actually crack this. All of you could crack this now. It's not hard mathematics, but it's one of those things that would require you to think a little bit. If both energy and entropy drops well, we're not going to be able to get further on unless we start looking at it about how this happens. But how can we know that this is right? I keep, I keep talking about nucleation condensation, but that's just something that I pulled out of my back pocket. How do we know that's true? Because if we look at the other models, then like you just explained there would be such a huge drop in entropy, but not a gain in energy. Well, that doesn't tell you that nucleation condensation is correct, right? Yeah. 
So, no, I can't really do that. So first, nuclear, this is a model. There's nothing that says this model is right. But remember the ones of the properties I said about free energies, that the free in general, the process, there might be multiple pathways a process can take. And if there are different free energy barriers, which one is going to be the dominant one? The one with the lowest. So all I need to come up with to explain this, to show that there is at least one possibility of all this where we would have a relatively low barrier. That doesn't mean that it's the lowest one, but if I have shown that there is one possibility, I've shown that obviously the barrier doesn't always have to be high. There might be something even better, but for a second it's going to turn out that it matches the experiments relatively well. But all I want to show now, nucleation condensation provides one way of explaining why these barriers do not get very high. So necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. So remember what, what nucleation condensation, sorry, this is a bit faint uh, pictures. What nucleation condensation did is that you start somehow forming a very small core here, and then we're adding more residues to the outside of this core gradually. And once you start having a fairly large volume here, each amino acid or residue inside this or is going to have well, the number of good interactions or the number of, well, yes, contacts or interactions or whatever you call them. Think of that the hydrogen bond or something or a hydrophobic, hydrophobic interaction. That's going to be roughly proportional to the number of residues in the native state, right? The volume we have in here. And that volume is roughly proportional to the radius of that one cubed. But when we form the very first contacts, we don't really have any volume yet. And so if I add something on the surface here, well, it's only the part here that's going to be proportional to the area that's going to be good. Every rest you will also have something that faces the outside. So initially, the number of interactions only goes up as roughly the area, which corresponds to the size r squared here. So this is hand waving, mind you. Uh, the, well, the book hand waves too, so it's not really... And that, I would argue, means that the energy of these interactions, there's going to be some sort of term proportional to the number of residues in the native state, and then a second term correspond to the number of residues in the native state raised to the power of two-thirds. Do you agree with that? So initially, the energy will go down, the blue line. To first approximation, it goes down proportionally. But initially, we're not going to gain that much because we don't really have any interaction partners yet. It's not until you actually start to form a slightly longer nucleus that the energy starts going down a bit. You can do exactly the same argument about entropy. So the entropy will initially drop. I can show you that here. The entropy will initially drop again. The first approximation, the entropy will drop as the number of residues we have bound in the native state because those residues can't move anymore. But on the other hand, the first few residues that are going to bind, they're actually going to, that entropy will lose, we will lose even more entropy initially when we start forming something because we don't really have any volume yet. But I'm certainly going to start by freezing two residues. And you can actually show that that term two is going to be proportional to the area. So both for the energy, as for enthalpy and the entropy, you're going to have that the main term is proportional to the number of residues, and then there is a second term that's proportional to the number of residues raised to two-thirds. Now, this will, of course, depend on temperature, because I, here I just said delta S, not T times delta S. But if we then take the difference between these two curves, in temperatures around room temperature, the blue lines will roughly cancel each other. So the only effect we're going to have remaining is going to be that red line minus that red line, which is going to give you a small energy barrier. Well, that didn't really help a whole lot, did it? So while I spent all these slides, you said through two and a half hours today too, and the best I could come up with saying that, well, rather than saying that this is proportion, rather than saying that this is an exponential race to the number of residues, we said that already eight lectures ago, this is now an exponential raise to the number of residues to the power of two-thirds. Tiny difference. Can we align that with the models then? So let's go back for a second. So why did I originally say that it was an exponential raise to the number of residues? Well, that has to do with Leventhal's paradox, right? That if, you have, if each residue has, say, two or three, it doesn't matter what the constant is, a number of confirmations,
the total number of possible orientations is then two or three raised to the number of residues. So that we have n in the exponent. All this gives us is that we still have some factor. I don't care what the factor is. And now we have an exponential with n raised to the power of 2 third. Do you remember that slide I showed you about large numbers and small numbers? Have a look at it again. It's very hard to grasp large and small numbers. If you put an n here, so this is going to be the difference of raising something to the power of 60 versus raising it to the power of 100. That's an insane difference. You're talking about seconds instead of 10 to the power of 10 years. So this explains it. So just because it looks almost the same, like it's a gigantic difference. And this explains Leventhal's paradox. The second we get n to the powers of 2 thirds there, it's not a problem anymore. We've solved it. This doesn't mean that it's true. All that I'm saying is that at least with one of these folding models, it is possible to come up with time behaviors that, sorry, it is possible to come up with a gradual drop in both enthalpy and entropy at the same time. So they cancel each other out. So this free energy barriers will be proportional to the end to the, the number of residues raised to two thirds. Oh, sorry, raised to the thirds, so it's not multiplied by two thirds. Have a little fun and see if you put some numbers in this tonight or something, just have an idea. Look at the exponential with the calculator. So how do we know that this is correct? Well, there are kind of two steps here, right? That the first one is that as theoreticians, we are very happy because we've now shown that there is at least one possible model that can do this. It could, of course, be that this model is still a factor of 10 off or something, but no theoretician words this salt cares about a factor of 10. Um, right with the, I guess you've seen this like that, right within an order of magnitude is frequently translated as wrong by an experimentalist. Um, but in particular, where you're talking about the exponential, something right within an order of magnitude is all we care about. The other cool thing is that we can measure this. And it turns out that if you take these, say 1.5 to 0 0.5 multiplied into the power of thirds, virtually all these small proteins measured, they fall within this range. A pure beta sheet also falls within this range. A pure alpha helix falls a bit slower. And that's because a pure alpha helix doesn't really have any folding nucleus or anything. That's kind of this, remember these one dimensional transitions we spoke about. So it's kind of reasonable that an alpha helix, which is almost one dimensional, falls a bit faster. This is a profound plot. What do we have on the x-axis here? Yes, and just above the x-axis you have what n originally is, right? So here we have 12 residues going out to 200 residues. So some of these proteins are starting to be fairly large. And if you look at the course, when you go from say 90 to 200, the logarithm of t goes from 0 to 10. So that means that the time goes up how much? The folding time? Yes, e to the power of 10, right? Which is a gigantic number. So why do you think that the proteins, why don't we have proteins significantly larger? Why don't we, why don't we have a whole lot of domains with 400 or 600 or 1,000 residues? It takes so long. Right. Because here you start to have something that takes probably several, I'm not sure what the prefactor here is, but at some point, so they, oh, sorry, no, sorry, here you have the calibration. That's 10 nanoseconds. And if you go up here, you're starting to approach seconds or something, right? Minutes. If you are at a minute and start to take something that takes another factor, e to the power of 10 longer, and another e to the power of 10 longer, you're very soon going to be in the range so that something would take 10 years to fold. Nature can't do that. It takes too long. So therefore, nature doesn't really have protein, protein domains that are significantly larger than this size. What does nature do instead? Yes. So this is why you have multiple domains. It's based on physics. Now, of course, the reason it's also based on Genomics and how mutations happen, right? But they go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. So what this really means is that folding, think of the, I think the folding funnel is a great, uh, well, I, I think it's the folding funnel is really a great concept. To think that folding is really a driven process. I think I have a slide that I can show you this. I'll come back to this in a second. Yes. 
Think of an energy landscape like this, that you're really going down. You see that this is almost guided here in the blue paths. And this is actually something derived from a very small peptide, I think. So that you don't randomly seek out the entire landscape, but you relatively quickly find some folding pathways. And that means that the real proteins you see are proteins that have evolved to have fairly well-defined folding pathways. If they do not have well-defined folding pathways, they would never get here. That leads to something else. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. There's just one thing I wanted to comment on this one. Eventually, as you start reducing these concentrations more and more and more and more, you don't get almost infinitely fast folding rates. Why not? So why does it start to go down here a bit? The theory doesn't fit the equations, it seems. Oh, sorry, the experiments don't seem to fit the equations. So that's kind of related to what we saw in this simulation uh, I showed you too, right? At some point, it's going to take some time for the actual folding to happen. There might be some folding intermediates or some rearrangement. So you don't keep going up here. There will be some things that eventually you're not just, you're not just limited entirely by the concentration or lack of denaturant, but there will be some small interior processes. The other thing is that you should be able to explain this. When do protein, what happens? This is my unfolded state. And remember these simple, I think you did some, you did this lab in the two dimensional state. You looked at energy diagrams, right? So if you have one native state here and then lots of other states up here. First, what happens if all the st these states are higher than the unfolded state? Right, because by definition, you're not gonna like to be folded. That's just a polypeptide. So the first thing that happens if you now drop these, say drop the, and that can happen at high temperature, for instance. If you now start to reduce the temperature or something, suddenly the native state has lower energy than the unfolded state, but there are lots of states up here. This is gonna be awesome, because if you ever go from the unfolded to one of these states, you're very quickly gonna go back, because they're worse. And then eventually when you go into the native state, you're gonna love it. But eventually, if the temperature drops too much or something, suddenly all these states are going to start having lower free induced than the unfolded state. And that corresponds exactly to the thing I think that this is bad. The packing is not correct here. So suddenly you have the fingers packed like that. I can't take that state and move it up to have my fingers correctly packed, right? But this is an awesome state. You have some good interactions here and you have some good entropy. So for this one now to unfold, we have to start paying a penalty. I have to break interactions here. And I have to pay, 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 pay. So I go back. And then eventually when I go back, I just get stuck in another state <laughs> because there were more misfolded states. So misfolding usually happens where you have many states that are more stable than the unfolded state. And eventually when you've tried this enough times, I might be able to find the really nice folded state I had. This is the case where large proteins usually fold much slower. They will fold. They will eventually find that state. So it's not necessarily prions or anything. But since we keep having so many things that go off the pathway that have to be corrected back, it will take longer to get here. And this is where chaperonins help. Large proteins that get stuck on the way, the chaperonins help bind these misfolded states and push them back to the unfolded state so that they will hopefully then go in the right direction. And eventually, of course, if you end up having two states that are much, much lower than the other ones here, then you might have a prion or something, but that's a separate chapter. I'm gonna, we're pretty much done, but I'm just gonna show you one small uh, real example. Yes, can I take two more minutes? There are some cool things that you can do with real modern examples. Um, and this is a protein called NTL9. It doesn't matter what it does, uh, but this is a much larger protein. That's like a pack of 50 residues. This has a folding time that takes about a millisecond. But this too has been possible to study in folding at home uh, with completely different fold models. I won't have time to go describe those models. But the cool thing that we can see in modern simulations is that sadly all those curves I showed you have been pure lies. A modern protein, a real protein doesn't fold. It's not one dimensional. You can't draw this as a free energy that it's single curve and that you have to go through all the states. So here, the red one might be the molten globular, the large, the size of these rings corresponds to how large the state is. But from the state, there are lots of other states you can go to. Each letter here is a state that they have observed in simulations. 
So this is an entire mesh network, a spider's web, so that you can, the size of the arrow here, that says how large the rate constants here. So you can see that the dominant folding pathway is to go from A to M to N for native. But you can certainly also imagine going from A to G to I to N. Both of them happen. And depending on what mutations you do and everything, one of these might be stronger than the other. You can even imagine having something that blocks one of these transitions and then it would take another pathway. This is pretty cool because as I'm, this type of thing is something that we've never been able to study with proteins before. And it might very well be that protein folding is really, in general, and how efficient the protein folds is really determined by the connectivity of these states. If you have lots of states that are connected in lots of ways, those four states are more likely to be on the folded pathway. Lots of fun research. I can upload this paper on the website too. Oh, and that reminds me, sorry, I forgot to upload the slide copies. I'll do that too after lunch. Um, so in this case, you have two folding pathways. The larger proteins are, the more pathways they appear to have. And for these proteins, you actually start to see it in the simulations. I'm not going to show the, uh, the video, but I can do a link to it. They start to have a little bit of the nucleation condensation folding rather than pure diffusion collision. So that as we move to larger proteins, the theories actually fit much better. Um, what this means, you can think of this temperature in another way, so that what happens really at high temperature, the reason why we don't fall at high temperatures is really that the entropic resistance becomes too large, we lose too much entropy. And the reason why we don't fall at too low temperatures is that the entropic resistance is suddenly too small, and that just means that we get trapped in the, lo in the closest local energy minimum, and then we don't have enough entropy to get out of it. I'm not sure how useful it is to think of it that way. I think I will stop there. Um, it's just one funny slide that I got from Michael um, that I like to use. Uh, remember that I spoke to you about all these protein folding in vivo in vitro. This is not so much a question or a result, but a fun way to think about it. You had DNA from RNA to protein to fold the protein, right? If you start to see what happens in life, you all know how to get from DNA to RNA. How do you get from DNA to RNA? Yes, T to U, right? AGC, T to AGCU. It's not particularly hard to write a computer program to do that. This is an insanely complicated biological problem with all these different states and everything involved. And then the RNA to protein, well, let's just triple it, right? The DNA, the uh, genomic uh, genetic code. You could write a computer program that does this in 10 minutes. <laughs> That's a ribosome factor. It's an insanely difficult problem too. On the other hand, protein sequence to folded protein, that is insanely hard to do in a computer. Basically, don't try to do it. Trivial in nature. Just find the free end. I'm not sure why, but it's a pretty fun way to look at things. And this course also somehow related to the difference between physics and bioinformatics. Overall, it's good to focus on the, it's better, whatever you do in life and work, try to stay in the green squares rather than in the red. Um, and I'm not kidding there. Like, it's surprisingly how common it is for people, for instance, try to fold proteins with brute force. It's not a particularly good way to try to predict something unless you absolutely need to. And same thing here, understanding exactly how this happens. Well, it might be interesting as a problem, but in practice, you're just going to predict it. Just use this in computers is that much easier. That's all I had for it today. Um, this covers books, chapters 90 to 21, um, most 19 and 20, actually, I think. And then we have a bunch of study questions for you. And that's pretty much I'm all I'm going to say about kinetics. This is a lot of physics, so my plan is that tomorrow, too, I'm going to take a fairly long discussion in the morning and try to go through this, but read up as much as you can, and then we'll talk about it. And then I will probably spend the second half of the lecture tomorrow talking a little bit about free energies and things you're going to do in the labs. Because now you know free energies in theory. The question is, how do you measure them in practice? Do you have any questions?